Kingdom Hearts is a series spanning 18 years, 7 platforms, 11 installments, and a few fairly distinct gameplay styles. The story has spiraled into a tapestry of insanity, going from simple concepts to ultimately including every complicated plot device up to time travel. It's so important now that Sora was the last DLC fighter for the biggest Smash game yet. I've been a fan of the series since I was a kid, and after all the insane, convoluted paths the story took, I found myself falling out of love with it, and I know I'm not alone. That's a story for another time, though. For now, we're going to go back in time to the year 2002 to remind ourselves it didn't have to be this way. Oh. If you find yourself in an elevator with a person that is powerful enough to make your dreams come true, would you be able to sell that dream to that person in the time it takes the elevator to go from floor 1 to floor 50? It's the old adage of the elevator pitch, and luckily for us, Disney and Squaresoft shared an office space back in the late years of the 20th century, and as fate would have it, Shinji Hashimoto, a producer at Square, met a Disney executive in an elevator and Kingdom Hearts was born, in a reductive sense anyway. To be clear, this wasn't Disney giving Square the keys to the Magic Kingdom, but it was sort of a tantalizing invitation to try and take them, at least for Tetsuo Nomura, a man who had been working as a character and graphic designer for Square since 1991. He joined the project as director after a friend of his, Jun Akiyama, begged him to not long after watching Tarzan. Nomura ended up overhearing a conversation between the previously mentioned Hashimoto and Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi about having Mickey in a video game, and Nomura expressed his interest in joining. Luckily, Nomura was able to design characters, and that character design was one of the many reasons Kingdom Hearts ended up being greenlit. Speaking of that green light, it didn't actually come for some time after. An article originally posted on the website Otakoto, entirely in Japanese, spells out the experience of Shuki Utsumi, the managing director for the Asian Pacific Territory at Disney Interactive, which means pitching the project for approval to Disney executives fell on his shoulders. The interesting thing here is that the studio at Square began production on the project, but no one had told them that the project had not been greenlit yet. A number of reasons for this were given. One, Disney had never approved a license in Japan for a title with a completely new setting. Two, Disney had never combined multiple franchises together into one title before. Three, Mickey Mouse had never been rendered in 3D prior to this project, meaning there was no style guide to go off of, not to mention any of the other myriad Disney characters that had to be rendered for this game. Finally, there was no one in Japan who had the authority to pass judgment on a project like this, and so the difficult task of getting Disney executives to Japan to view a presentation had to be undertaken. There was a chance that on any given day, someone could have walked into the room and told everyone to stop what they were doing because it was over. Spoiler alert, that didn't happen. But reading about all of this gives one a sense of intensity and perhaps even anxiety for the project. Speaking of anxiety, those executives were Michael Eisner and his successor, Bob Iger, as well as over 100 smaller staffers to the company. Eisner is considered to be the man that revitalized Disney in the late 80s and early 90s, so this man was incredibly influential and intimidating. Utsumi even remarks that Eisner's presence in the room made it feel like he was an emperor of China, that was the level of influence and control he had over the room, at least that Utsumi perceived. The presentation came to a close and Eisner simply said something along the lines of, keep at it and do it right. And from that point on, production was in full effect. All of this from the team working under the assumption of a green light to the nervous jitters conveyed through Utsumi's tale gives the sense that this game was one that was born out of a legitimate sense of wonder and desire to create something fresh. Conceptually, it's a Disney game with a Final Fantasy story. Our main character, Sora, went through some renovations prior to coming into full realization. One of the earlier versions depicted him as some sort of lion boy with a chainsaw blade. Apparently the people reviewing it literally told Nomura that it was terrible, but since he didn't understand English well at the time, he didn't take it to heart and continued on anyway. The final version we got looks a lot like a Final Fantasy version of Mickey, with many minute details added on and of course lots of chains, like a constant reminder that Mickey was a big inspiration for this game. Another inspiration was, funnily enough, Super Mario 64. It can be hard to tell what exactly was inspired by it, though. Even if you haven't played a game in the series, you probably still know that this game is an action RPG and therefore is very different from the likes of Mario 64. The thing that is most similar is the level structure. Imagine all the worlds you visit in this game being connected by one cohesive hub map like Peach's Castle, and you'll see what I mean. 
Gameplay-wise, it is obviously most like Final Fantasy in many ways, except real-time instead of turn-based. But I have a feeling that Mario 64 2 was an inspiration in this regard in some ways, especially the decision to go real-time, being that Kingdom Hearts truly was one of the first 3D action RPGs. You can point to Secret of Mana and others for inspiration, and the hyperbolic nature of this next sentence scares me, but the influence Kingdom Hearts has had on the JRPG genre and video games as a whole probably can't be understated. And yet, it's still kind of funny that Super Mario 64 is cited as an inspiration because the platforming is so terrible. Anyway, I think the development story of this one is really fascinating. The heart of the people developing it definitely comes through in the game, through its gameplay, its story, and its presentation. Is it a perfect game? Of course not. In fact, I found way more faults in it than I thought that I would after a one year hiatus from the series. But there's a passion there that I can't say has been present in all of the games I've talked about, and that alone has made this a fun project to work on. Passion is something that affects every aspect of a game's production, a lack thereof is a negative thing of course, and the person whose passion matters the most is the director. I have no doubt that the people working on, insert next Call of Duty game here, have a lot of passion for what they are doing, but the heads of the team, as well as the publisher, lack passion in favor of other very important things like huge fat stacks of cash. And no, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, because whether I, as someone who tends to like more creative projects, wants to admit or not, the video game industry is still an industry and money is a part of business. Without getting into all of that, I'll just say that my passion is for talking about games that clearly have passion behind them in a creative sense, and that is perhaps why my last video could come off to some as more negative or angry, and that's why I'm glad Kingdom Hearts falls into this bracket. And now, let's begin. The game opens with some vague sort of poetic lines that may or may not have any payoff by the end. This is followed by the Square patented opening cinematic with way better graphics than the rest of the game scene. I remember as a kid I would always dream of a day when games could look this good all the time. As it turns out, it took roughly 15 years for games to actually live up to that unrealistic standard. The biggest thing that makes this cutscene look better than most of the games on the 7th gen is not necessarily the raw graphical fidelity or whatever, it's stuff like their clothes realistically flowing in the wind or laying over their body and bending with them when they do, or their hair having any sign of life at all. It wasn't until 8th gen that stuff like this started to be focused on, or perhaps even possible. And even then, this cutscene gives modern games a run for their money in terms of detail and the way their clothing moves on their body. That being said, this cutscene is also pre-rendered CGI, and the clothing was either animated by hand or there were systems in place that could realistically render fabric in response to outside stimuli, and there was no limit to how long it would need to take to render it since, once that's done, the game just plays it in a movie file format. Whereas I'm comparing it to modern games that have to devote a lot of resources to similar systems. So I guess this is more of a praise for modern games actually being able to achieve this sort of thing, but I do think this cutscene still holds up in terms of animation quality. The imagery you're seeing here is delightfully nonsensical to those who don't know what's going on, and to even those that do, like myself, I have trouble pointing to specific practical metaphors. I'll show any that come up as the story unfolds, but my favorite thing about this scene is the vibes it gives off. I don't know what I was expecting after hitting new games, a beautiful piano melody serenaded me, but it wasn't techno dance over bizarre visuals. The song here, Simple and Clean, is the theme song for the game and is quite honestly a bop. Regardless, the scene ends eventually and we are dropped onto a stained glass platform. This place is called the Dive to the Heart and contains the main tutorial for the game. After a short introduction to the movement, the game tells us to give the power within us form and it will give us strength, and we are greeted with a choice. The sword, the shield, and the staff. Touching each will give an ominous description, and then the game will ask if you want to take the item. This is a framing device for deciding what kind of Sora we want to be. One that focuses on melee strength, defense, or magic power. Since this game doesn't give you the ability to allocate points into each of your stats manually upon leveling, this is this game's version of choosing your build. This will also determine the order in which you earn abilities as you level. On top of telling the game which stat you prefer, you also must tell the game what stat you want to give up. This means there are 9 different possible combinations for your progression, although we will see later that this choice actually is somewhat negligible by the end of the game. The other thing which this changes is the weapon you use for the remainder of the dive to the heart, which makes anyone picking shield sigh in dismay at your quarter inch attack reach. Not long after we fight our first enemy, the Shadow. A great introductory enemy that you will see a lot over the duration of this game. A little more tutorializing passes before we are dumped into this location with three characters you may recognize. The game gives us three questions to answer with three possible answers. 
It reads like a personality test, but in reality, we are picking our leveling priority. If we choose mostly top options, we get Dawn, which means we will level faster from levels 1 to 35 and then begin to slow down. Mostly bottom options gives us Dusk, which means we level more slowly until 35, but more quickly after that point. And the middle options give us Midday, which is always somewhere in between the two. This chart handily shows this relationship, and each path has benefits. If you only plan on playing to the end of the story and ignoring the end game, then Dawn is probably your best bet. With Dusk, you have a harder time leveling in the early game, meaning that you may become underleveled depending on how much grinding you do on random enemy encounters, but you actually end up needing about 100,000 less experience to hit max level, and you'll be leveling more quickly once you hit the grind that is level 50 to 100. Midday is a good middle ground if you don't want to level slowly in the early game, but also intend on hitting the level cap at some point. After this, we get a little more instruction before heading up these stairs to our first boss fight. This big guy's name is Darkseid. He's ridiculously easy and has basically no chance of killing you unless you stand around and take some hits, but that's okay because he's the first boss. You just spam the attack button until he dies. Clearly, this is the only boss in this game that will be like this. This one is just an introduction. Unless... Also, so this is clearly what the game looks like nowadays. Just for clarity, I'm recording this game on my PS4 with the all-in-one version of the game, which is the HD remaster of Kingdom Hearts Final Mix, and if you're exceptionally confused right now, don't worry, it gets worse. Basically, what I'm getting at here is that the brightness is all off in this version. This is a little closer to what I remember it looking like, and Darkseid was significantly more ominous and scary back then. So anyway, the game reminds us that we will be the one to open the door, and then we are greeted with a tranquil sight, a beach at the edge of an island surrounded by endless swaths of water. Sora wakes up before getting startled by Kairi standing over him. Whoa. We learn that Sora's been having weird dreams, that Kairi isn't originally from here, and one more kid walks up to complete the trio. Riku indicates that he's the only one working on a raft of dubious purpose before Sora and Riku take off in a race. This is Destiny Islands, our opening map to explore. Kairi sends us around the island to collect some items and we can meet Titus, Waka, and Selfie, and even spar with them. So up to this point it appears that on this island live six kids and no one else. Cool. This is obviously completely ridiculous, but I suppose it's sort of analogous to a dream many kids have of a paradise with no adult oversight. There are implications that there is a mainland somewhere, but we can't see it from the island which is a little odd. And as long as we're talking about weird inconsistencies with Disney Islands, we learn later that the reason the trio are building a raft is because they want to go out and explore other worlds. So why do they need a rickety looking raft built out of logs if they have these very nice looking boats that they already use? Whose boat? And Kyrie's. Again, all of this is pretty silly, but the important thing here is that in about 30 minutes when Destiny Islands is over, it basically never comes up again in terms of the plot driving the story. That scene where we learn the purpose of the raft also has our first bit of characterization. We can see Riku here talking with a lot of conviction about the raft plan. Sora takes a more lackadaisical approach, and Kairi pretty much seems up for anything for the most part. We also get some teasing from Riku to Sora. A palpu fruit? If two people share one, their destinies become intertwined. They'll remain a part of each other's lives, no matter what. Come on, I know you want to try it. What are you talking? <laughs> This Palpu fruit will remain important for the duration of the game in a few different ways, but for now we will be spending the large part of Destiny Islands establishing these three characters. Another scene greets us now, this time with a silly little duck walking down a hallway. He finds Pluto with a letter in his mouth. As it turns out, the king is missing, and Donald rushes to tell Goofy. Donald is the king's head wizard, and Goofy is the king's captain of the guard in a sense. Yes, I just said that. And what is the king king over, anyway? Not really sure, but anyway, this scene ends and we are brought back to Destiny Islands. Today, Sora and Riku race for the opportunity to name the raft. This is a great way to show the rivalry between Sora and Riku. If I win, I'm captain. And if you win, I get to share the Palpu with Kairi. Huh? Deal? The winner gets to share a Palpu with Kairi. Um, wait a minute. Riku is also naturally faster than Sora, and you have to use really good pathing in order to beat him. After the race, Sora tallies up the score between them, which is also affected by the sparring battle you can have with him. Speaking of the sparring battles, let's discuss those real fast. Selfie, Waka, Titus, and Riku each have a sparring battle that you can engage in by talking to them, and you can also fight all three of the Final Fantasy characters at once as well. Selfie is the easiest and simplest. A few basic attacks come at you moderately slowly, and she's pretty easy to accidentally parry with your own strikes. I'm of the opinion that these four sparring fights are designed in such a way to subtly teach you things about the combat without telling you outright. 
Selfie is meant to teach you about parrying with your attacks, something that is extra highlighted by the Tech 1P popping up there, and is important since the game won't give you the guard ability until either level 15, 24, or at worst 33, depending on which specialization you chose at the beginning. The next fight up is Titus, and he teaches the player the opposite. Some enemies have much better stability and need to be hit at certain times to knock them off guard, not to mention attempting to parry him will usually result in being knocked off balance rather than parrying. His moveset is easy to predict though, so it's not like the game is really challenging the player yet. Waka uses his blitz ball as a long ranged weapon, something we have yet to deal with. He always tries to keep his distance from the player, so going for him directly feels like a wasted effort. Given the way his attacks work, it is likely that you will accidentally return one of his balls back at him, perhaps missing on the first shot. Try again and you'll get another tech point and he will be stunned from the hit, opening him up for free damage. Later in the battle he uses a more powerful and harder to time version of the attack, solidifying the player's ability to pull it off. Even the 3 on 1 battle teaches the player something. Sometimes the game designers want to kick you in the teeth, and that's okay. This will, debatably, be the last time this happens until the end game. Then there's Riku, the toughest of the combat quartet we've got here. He hits hard and moves quickly, jumps around sporadically, and occasionally even baits out your attacks to punish you. None of that is even close to the dirtiest trick up his sleeve, however. Check this out. That attack comes at you every time you hit Riku four times. If you press the attack button after you've triggered this move, you will get hit, and it will do a massive amount of damage. The lesson the game is teaching you is to avoid button mashing. You have to pick your attacks carefully and make sure you're paying attention. Whether the game even properly tests you on this lesson, well, we'll get to that. I think this is a great idea, however. Punishing the player for spamming attacks is a pretty big cornerstone of modern combat systems that are typically considered great, and Kingdom Hearts flirts with the idea here. Setting the threshold to be 4 hits means it's consistent and predictable, and getting hit by that attack is purely your fault, so it never feels cheap. At this stage in the game, it's good, and if you win, Sora gets another point over Riku, but if you lose, Riku gets a point. Win or lose, you also have a laundry list of crap to collect today. While on the prowl, you will eventually stumble into the secret place. Cave drawings, clearly from the kids, adorn the walls, and Sora takes this opportunity to add one of Kairi eating a palpu fruit before he's interrupted by a voice in the darkness. Well, darkness if you're playing on the PS2 version anyway. This world has been connected. Well, what are you talking about? Tied to the darkness. Soon to be completely eclipsed. You do not yet know what lies beyond the door. So you're from another world? You understand so little. I'm gonna get out and learn what's out there. A meaningless effort. One who knows nothing can understand nothing. Eventually, he leaves and we go back to our scavenger hunt. Next, we get a couple more scenes, one between Sora and Kairi, and another between Donald and Goofy, and the rest of the Disney crew we've met so far. Sora and Kairi chat about the future, about what's going to happen if they leave, about changing. The king wants Donald and Goofy to find someone with a key and stick with them while they try to solve the stars going out issue. Jiminy Cricket joins on to chronicle the adventure, and they begin down the stairs. Goofy makes an off comment about how they have to protect the world order by not letting on where they're from. They get in this crazy looking ship and they are off. Back at Destiny Islands, things are looking less cheery. Sora, dinner's ready, come on down. Sora? When we go out to the island proper, we are surrounded by a seemingly endless swarm of shadows that we can't fight for some reason. Eventually, we stumble into Riku. Where's Kairi? I thought she was with you. The door is open. What? The door is open, Sora. Now we can go to the outside world. What are you talking about? We've got to find Kyrie. Kyrie's coming with us. Once we step through, we might not be able to come back. We may never see our parents again. There's no turning back. But this may be our only chance. We can't let fear stop us. I'm not afraid of the darkness. Riku? Sora and Riku are swallowed up by the darkness. Until a light bursts forth. Suddenly, Sora's wooden toy sword is replaced by a weapon in the shape of a key. The Keyblade. Now we can fight the shadows. 
We fight our way to the secret place and find Kairi. Kairi! Sora. We are thrust back out onto the island, or whatever is left of it, and must fight Darkseid once again. After his defeat, we are pulled into the void hanging above us along with the rest of the island. The next thing we see is Donald and Goofy staring up into the sky as one lone star disappears. They remark that they need to find the key, and that someone named Leon might know. Meanwhile, Pluto finds Sora in an alleyway. This is Traverse Town, a world separate from the islands we are so far used to. Talking to some of the people around here will show you that this place seems to be some sort of in-between for people whose worlds have been destroyed. We stumble onto the accessory shop and meet Sid, who tells us he will look after us if we get into trouble. With nothing left to do, we go and explore the city. The first thing we see is someone dying and turning into a heartless, a tone shift to be sure. Regardless of where we go, Donald and Goofy are always one step behind us. The trigger to move on is to beat five shadows and then go back to the accessory shop and chat with Sid again. Upon stepping outside, we're greeted by someone. Where? Who are you? And they'll keep on coming at you. As long as you continue to wield the Keyblade. But why? Why would it choose a kid like you? Hey! What's that supposed to mean? Never mind. Now, let's see that Keyblade. What? There's no way you're getting this! Alright. Then have it your way. This is the first actually tough fight in the game, barring maybe the sparring session with Riku on the islands, but that one's optional. Leon hits like a truck and has a homing fireball that can be tough to dodge if you aren't careful. The fireball can be knocked back at him with proper timing, just like Waka's blitz balls, and also results in a stun period. This fight is very tough and comes out of nowhere, but luckily you don't have to complete it. Whether you drain his health or he drains yours, the game moves on anyway. <sighs> Next up, we get an exposition dump, courtesy of the Final Fantasy gang. I'll let them handle this. Those creatures that attacked you are after the Keyblade. But it's your heart they really want, because you wield the Keyblade. I'm so glad that you're okay, Kairi. Kairi? Who are you talking about? I'm the Great Ninja Yuffie. Hmm? I think you might have overdone it, Squall. That's Leon. The Keyblade. Still, hard to believe that you, of all people, are the Chosen One. Well, I suppose beggars can't be choosers. Why don't you start making sense? What's going on here? Okay, you know there are many other worlds out there. Yeah. But they're supposed to be a secret. When the Heartless came, everything changed. The Heartless? The ones who attacked you, you remember? Those without hearts. The darkness in people's hearts. That's what attracts them. And there is darkness within every heart. Hey, have you heard of someone named Ansem? I am Sam. He was studying the Heartless. He recorded all of his findings in a very detailed report. Its pages are scattered everywhere. Oh, then maybe the king went to find them. Red! So, this is the key. The Heartless have great fear of the Keyblade. That's why they'll keep coming after you, no matter what. Well, I didn't ask for this. The Keyblade chooses its master, and it chose you. So, tough luck. How did all this happen? I remember being in my room. <gasps> Wait a minute! What happened to my home? My island! Riku! Kairi! You know what? I really don't know. After that's over, we get attacked by some soldiers and we're told to go find their leader. Eventually, we stumble into the third district where we get the first taste of the incompetence of our party members. Gorge, are these the heartless guys? Let's go get them! Go see! <laughs> One short fight with some soldiers later, and the head honcho shows up. Guard armor. 
Guard Armor is the first real challenging boss that can't be lost. I, I mean, it can be lost, but you'll just get shunt to the game over screen. He's another unique specimen because each piece of his body acts independently and has its own health bar. For part of the battle, they will work together, but eventually they will split up and begin attacking separately and more quickly. He's tough mostly because it can be hard to keep track of what each body part is doing and when you need to play more defensively. Luckily, all of their attacks can be parried, so it's fairly easy to get stun time on them to wail for a while. This boss also finishes out the boss design trifecta we will be seeing throughout the game. Any given boss can be divided into one of these three categories, and we've conveniently already seen an example of each. First, we've got human-sized bosses, fights like Leon, Riku, so on. These are more often than not solo fights without your party, which is interesting. Then we have enormous bosses like Darkseid. They usually have more than one weak spot and move more slowly. Their attacks generally cover large swaths of the battlefield as well. Then there's multi-target fights, where more than one entity is trying to take you down at once, like with Guard Armor here. These are more frantic and require a different approach than the other two styles, but luckily Donald and Goofy will be around to take some of the heat for you. After we finish off Guard Armor, we finally get to know these two goofballs for real. Hey, why don't you come with us? We can go to other worlds on our vessel. I wonder if I could find Riku and Kairi. Of course. Are you sure? Who knows? But we need them to come with us to help us find the kid. Yeah, I guess. But you can't come along looking like that. Understand? Ooh. No frowning, no sad face, okay? Yeah, you gotta look funny, like us. <laughs> yep. Whoa. This boat runs on happy faces. Happy? That's one funny face. Okay, why not? I'll go with you guys. Donald Duck! Name's Goofy. I'm Sora. All for one, one for all. After that eclectic scene, we get a number of gifts from our new friends. From Donald, we get our first spell, fire, and that ominous blue bar is finally worth something. Goofy gives us dodge roll, an ability that costs a resource, that being ability points or AP. Do I find it strange that a mechanic like dodge roll, something that has become a default mechanic in numerous action games like this one, is relegated to an ability that you have to sacrifice ability points for? Yes, I do, but I'll talk about that more later. If we beat Leon earlier, he gives us an elixir here, and we get some seed money from everyone for the trip. We can continue to explore Traverse Town if we want, but our goal as of now is to fly off to New Worlds in search of Riku, Kairi, and the King. And so off we go for the bulk of the game. So now we get to what is the bulk of the game. From this point on till we hit Hollow Bastion will be the same formula repeated seven times over. The formula is this, travel to different worlds on the gummy ship, land and figure out what's going on, solve a problem with whatever Disney characters are there, fight New Heartless, fight a boss, and then move on to the next world. Obviously this is somewhat reductive, but generally this is how it's going to work for the next eight hours or so. So let's talk an overview about how these stories play out. Each world is based off of a Disney movie. We've got Wonderland from Alice in Wonderland, Olympus from Hercules, Deep Jungle from Tarzan, Agrabah from Aladdin, Atlantica from Little Mermaid, Monstro from Pinocchio, Halloween Town from Nightmare Before Christmas, and finally Neverland from Peter Pan. Well, sort of. Really, it's just Captain Hook's boat. With a couple exceptions, each world uses elements of the story they are based on in order to inform the small-scale plot that we experience there. However, these stories are not just beat-by-beat -beat retellings of the movie they are borrowed from. The characters and events of this game always have an effect on the story. One good example is the first world most will visit, Wonderland. In it we see our trio getting wrapped up into a trial which Alice is being put on, for the attempted theft of the Queen's heart. The trial is an element from the original story, but the crime is something new to this game. It stands to reason that, since the Heartless have only started cropping up recently, that the Queen of Hearts would not have known what exactly was happening to her, and being how fiery and, well, let's just say it, stupid she is, she decides to blame it on the newcomer Alice. Our trio knows that the likely culprit is the Heartless, although it's possible that there was someone else that spurred these events on, so the trio decides to try and clear her name. The idea of our trio needing to keep the world order comes back up here as well, and manifests practically in the trio not naming the Heartless directly as culprits. This trial involves collecting evidence of Heartless presence in the area. 
Four pieces of evidence sit waiting to be grabbed in the world, and finding one particular piece of evidence will also give you early access to the Blizzard spell. The more you grab, the higher chance that you won't accidentally implicate one of your friends, which would lock them up in the event battle that takes place after the trial. Once that's over, we find that Alice was taken away, and we have to figure out what exactly is going on. While we don't find any more evidence, we do eventually find the Trick Master, an enormous heartless with a strange and interesting design, who uses fire on us, making that early Blizzard spell a helpful one. After that, we find a strange keyhole in the mouth of the talking door, which the keyblade seems to be drawn toward, and the keyhole is locked. And Wonderland is complete. So to analyze things a bit, I think using the elements from the original story but spinning them in a different way using the elements presented in this game is a really good idea. Wonderland is an interesting example of this, but unfortunately the game doesn't keep up that level of quality in its Disney worlds. I would call Wonderland mildly interesting, and it ties back into some of the ideas presented thus far like the need to keep world order, but it doesn't do much to further the overall plot by the end. It's like a filler episode in an anime. And with the exception of one missing link, that being Alice, Wonderland could be cut from the game and the story would not change. And the whole world order thing is not very well utilized. Again, it's a really interesting idea, but it never goes very far. All of this builds to a feeling that most of the Disney worlds are simply there to pad out the gameplay time, so you have somewhere to go and something to do. I'm not necessarily asking that every Disney world have some important plot that is clearly masterminded by the villain, but things like the consequences of the trio keeping or failing to keep order on their travels are great ways to explore the characters and story without actually having to have an urgent plot related to the overall story. Alice's kidnapping is related to the main plot, and barely at that, but that's really all it does. There's no character development or exploration of the relationship between these characters and the Disney ones. This is sort of a difficult thing to quantify because, like I said, I don't necessarily want every Disney world to be really urgent or have clear involvement from the main villain, but I also think that they need a little more than some of these stories provide. Let's look at another example, Deep Jungle. This one starts with a crash landing after a dispute between Donald and Sora about whether the King or Rico and Kairi would even be there due to its backwater nature. Sora meets up with Tarzan and he claims he might know where Sora's friends are. Right! My friends! There's two of them. The loud one is Don- You know what? Never mind. I'm looking for my friends Riku and Kairi. But he speaks in gorilla, so Sora doesn't fully understand what he means. Tarzan moves to take Sora to his friends. You quickly find Donald and Goofy, but Donald and Sora continue to butt heads for the rest of your stay. I like this because Donald and Goofy are not necessarily friends with Sora at this point. The only reason they are traveling with him is because he has the Keyblade. So for them to get along perfectly for the whole game, while tensions are undoubtedly high, would have made no sense. Moving forward, we use a slideshow to try and jog Tarzan's memory so he can remember where Sora's friends are. One particular slide comes up and Sora remarks that it's familiar to him. Here we go, this is a good detail that we'll tie back into the story later, but it's not so in your face as to be contrived. There's even a decent reason why this would be in a Disney world that would otherwise be disconnected from a castle like this, but that's for another time. Tarzan still doesn't know the word he's looking for, and Clayton proposes that the gorillas are the answer. We go there, but the gorillas are angry at us for coming here at all. Then the gorillas start being attacked by Heartless and we have to rescue them. Eventually we go for the source, Clayton, and after that we go to the cave within the heart of the mountain and lock this world's keyhole. Oh, now I've got it. Ha <laughs> means ha. Friends in our hearts. Heart. Oh, so that's what it meant. Friends. Same heart. Clayton. Lose heart. No heart. No see friends. No heart. No friends. Sorry about what I said. I'm sorry too. Yeah! for one, huh? Deep Jungle is actually a pretty good example of my point. It starts out really strong. There's some drama between two of the main characters for solid, understandable reasons. While getting to know and deal with the Disney story, we also are getting to know and dealing with character flaws present in the main cast. Then we get a plot detail in the form of this slide. We don't know what Sora means by this and won't for some time, if ever. It's actually a pretty subtle thing. But it's enough to keep the intrigue of what's going on alive. The problem with Deep Jungle is that, after this point, it jumps right off the cliff into a name backtracking revolving around a story that is completely irrelevant after a few minutes. 
Part of the problem with these worlds has to do with the inherent difficulty of adapting a Disney movie, around an hour and 30 minutes of story content, into a roughly 45 minute long section of a much larger game, with gameplay sections in which basically no story can be conveyed. That problem is this. Why does Clayton want to kill the gorillas? If your answer contains any details from the movie that aren't present in the game, that's the wrong answer. If your answer is, the game never tells us, you're correct, because it doesn't. I don't necessarily envy the writers who had to be constantly trading off plots, characters, and locations every hour or so. I can't imagine that it was easy to write a story under those confines. But the answer is staring you in the face. The first quarter of Deep Jungle is strong because it focuses on this game and its characters rather than the Disney characters they happen to be around. It uses Deep Jungle, its setting and characters, as a backdrop to explore the relationship between the main characters and details of the overarching plot. The second half is poor because it devotes too much time to a story that we don't get and a villain that is underexplained, both due to a lack of details that I'm sure were necessary to cut, but were cut nonetheless. However, it's not quite enough to just have drama between characters or details that tie into the overarching plot. A lot of effort is needed to make these connections work. My last example of the Disney World stories is Atlantica. This one, as we will see, tries really hard to be profound with the narrative but fails for a few reasons. When we get there, we are transformed into ocean creatures using Donald's unexplained magic, and we pose as creatures from far off ocean in order to avoid upsetting the world order. We meet Ariel and then go and meet King Triton. Most of the story is spent swimming around the ocean, looking for the keyhole, and getting closer to Ursula, who wants Triton's trident so she can possess incredible power. Triton isn't super happy when he figures out that we're the Keyblade Wielder. He acts as though he has prior experience with Keyblade Wielders. Perhaps they have wronged him before. As the key bearer, you must already know one must not meddle in the affairs of other worlds. Of course I know that, but... You have violated this principle. The key bearer shatters peace and brings ruin. Oh, Sora's not like that. I thank you for saving my daughter, but there is no room in my ocean for you or your key. It's also notable that this is the first world we've come to where someone who isn't the villain actually has any idea about the worlds and the trio's motives. If Trident really does have experience with past Keyblade wielders, there's no proof of it anywhere. He doesn't tell any stories about the subject, nor are there any details in the world that would point to that idea. This calls this blatant attack on Sora and his attempt to seal the keyhole into question. Why does Triton hate the Keyblade so much? Does he simply associate the presence of the Keyblade with the presence of Heartless? While that is true, it's also true that, if Sora had never shown up, Ursula would have nothing stopping her from taking over Atlantica. Sure, that's the end of the story and he does renounce that viewpoint by the end. But then what about the whole meddling in the affairs of other worlds thing? This is about the last time this idea is brought up, and it makes less sense here than it ever has. Triton is furious because he says the Keyblade Wielder wreaks destruction and brings ruin, but we can verifiably state that Sora's presence in the worlds he has gone to so far has had nothing but a positive effect. He always solves the problem and locks the keyhole. So for Triton to spout off at the mouth without justifying it with some prior experience is just really strange and seems like a missed opportunity to call some moral ambiguity into question, even if Sora is clearly not like whatever past Keyblade wielder caused Triton's dismay. As it stands, it's just odd, incomplete even. And it's sad. I find a lot of these concepts to be pretty interesting. It makes sense that the past Keyblade wielders, especially those of a less childlike nature, would have been more dangerous to the people that came to help. I'm imagining a conquering paladin type that only helps those that can help them, or someone who just comes in kicking the crap out of everybody that stands in their way, which is almost what Sora does, but he clearly is only beating up the bad people. Regardless, many of these concepts just don't get the time or effort needed to explore them fully. But you know what? That's enough talk about the story for now. There's still plenty to cover, but it's high time to talk about what half of the people that enjoy this game play it for, the gameplay. Like I mentioned earlier, Kingdom Hearts is one of the first 3D action RPGs and a lot of praise is owed to it for some of the things that it accomplished without another game to guide it. It also stumbles over itself in numerous areas lest we forget. Let's start with combat. The main pillar of combat is the basic attack command. When used, Sora will determine which attack he uses based on a few factors, such as the proximity of nearby enemies and how many attacks have already been used in the combo. After the second hit, he will use a finisher which does much more damage and then he will reset to neutral. There's no way to perfectly determine which attack he will use, but generally speaking his pool of potential attacks is pretty small. The first and second attack is interchangeable and the finisher is always unique to itself. 
If an enemy is slightly farther away, Sora will tend to use the forward stab, followed by an overhead strike, and then the finisher. If the enemy is closer, he'll start with the overhead strike, since it doesn't cover as much ground. If there are multiple enemies, he has a wider arcing body slash, which he can also slot into either the first or second attack. So there's no combos in this sense that many people think of them. There's no light or heavy attacks and no way to consistently chain attacks together in order to get a certain outcome. The same is true with aerial attacks. Sora will pick his first two somewhat randomly followed by the finisher. More attacks and more finishers can be added through abilities which Sora will add to his pool. We'll discuss these in more detail momentarily. Some might see this as being overly simplified. Others might be frustrated that the attacks are somewhat randomized, and I can't say that you're wrong for feeling that way. I find that Sora does a decent enough job of picking the best attack for the situation, but some contexts prove that isn't always true, which I'll bring up later. With that said, it's definitely not for everybody, and I do have some issues with it, but let me go over the other elements of combat first. Speaking of elements, man, that was a great segue. We get access to a whole slew of magic spells to add to our arsenal as rewards for progressing through the game. A quick overview, fire is exactly what you would expect, a fireball that travels toward enemies. A unique property of this spell is it homes in on the target, so it can catch enemies easily even if they move around a bit. Blizzard is a similar spell but with no homing effect. Instead it functions more like a shotgun with multiple projectiles splitting outward from the blade when cast. Thunder is, in actuality, a lightning spell that comes down from above. It's pretty basic but very powerful. Gravity is the most interesting. It has an area of effect and does damage equal to a percentage that is calculated using this formula. You may notice that max MP has a factor in the calculation, something I'm going to discuss when we talk about the RPG elements. So gravity is great for enemies and even some bosses with large health bars. Stop is a utility spell that freezes enemies in their tracks. Any damage dealt during this time is saved up and done all at once when the spell ends. Arrow is a wind barrier that halves any incoming damage. This is very handy since there are many situations in which unavoidable damage is a necessary trade-off for actually being able to attack. And finally, Cure is exactly what it says on the tin. It heals a certain amount of HP and can, along with Arrow, target Sora, Donald, or Goofy. These seven spells make up your magical options, and each of them has certain situations in which they shine. Another element of combat, though not on the same level as the previous two like the structuring of this discussion would imply, is item usage. Just like with spells, if you're familiar with Final Fantasy, you'll understand these item categories. Potions heal HP, Aethers recover MP, Elixirs fully recover both. Potions come in three varieties, Standard, High, and Mega. The Mega variant targets the whole party instead of just one member, Elixirs and Aethers have a Mega variant as well. These are technically called battle items because they can be equipped and used during battle. Sora and your party members each have a certain number of item slots that can hold any battle item and can be used during combat, but can only be restocked in between battles. This is a good system. It limits your healing potential, but doesn't limit it so much that the game becomes significantly harder than it would be. The healing system of any game will point you toward the design philosophy behind it. If you can't get more healing until you hit some sort of checkpoint, then the game is typically about stamina. This game is not because after every battle you can re-equip items to your heart's content. The difficulty comes in with enemies that deal a lot of damage and bosses that must be chopped down without a break, as well as the sheer number of enemies the game will throw at you at times. Another aspect of battle items that must be mentioned is the manner of using them during combat. Selecting any item that isn't a mega variant gives you a nested menu to decide who to use it on. Sora then tosses the item in the air, and after around 68 frames or a hair over one second, the item connects and performs its job of restoring whatever it's intended to. The interesting thing about this is that the item isn't cancelled if you are hit by something during the animation. The only thing that will stop the item going off once it's in the air is if you die. The item will still heal you even if you are knocked out of the animation, which is a really cool mechanic because it sets it apart from the cure spell, where the animation must complete before it takes effect. That is, if you don't have Leaf Bracer equipped, which gives you invincibility frames during the animation of the cure spell. This is another reason why Leaf Bracer is so strange an inclusion here. Once you get Cure and Leaf Bracer, there is almost no reason to use healing items because they are just plain more dangerous and less rewarding. I'm going to talk more about Leaf Bracer later, but for now, let's wrap up items. On top of battle items, there are camp items which can only be used from the menu and in between battles. Each of them affects every party member. Tents fully restore HP, camping sets fully restore HP and 3 MP, cottages fully restore both. Technically speaking, power-ups, defense-ups, and AP-ups also count, but these improve stats rather than heal. Not much else to say here. If you're in between battles but have no save point in sight, you can pop one of these off to heal up. Finally, and arguably the least important of the battle elements at your disposal, is summons. Each of these spawns in a Disney character to aid you in battle in numerous ways. 
The summon gauge determines how long the summon sticks around and is reduced by using the summon to attack. Simba is the first that you will acquire and has a basic area of effect attack that you have to charge up. Bambi will drop orbs for you and can even drop special items if you kill enough enemies. Genie locks onto Heartless and when the Showtime command is used, he will select a magic spell randomly from this list anywhere from 3 to 5 times based on how many enemies are in the area. Dumbo makes Sora invulnerable, gives minor flight, and can blast enemies away with water, dealing minimal damage. Mushu attacks enemies from a distance with fireballs. Notably, he is the only summon that allows you free movement, but doesn't allow you to attack normally. Finally, Tinkerbell, the most unique of the bunch. She is the only summon with no summon gauge, and she doesn't despawn Sora's party members like the others. She remains with Sora and heals him continuously until she is dismissed and will revive him if his HP hits zero, which will also dismiss her. Overall, I find these summons to be underwhelming, but I also tend to play melee-focused characters so they don't work for me as well. Even with magic-focused characters, these summons won't just flat out win you battles, especially most boss fights. Simba can tear through heartless mobs though, that's for sure. All of these mechanics are housed within the command menu, ever present in the bottom left corner of the screen. Most games have a dedicated button for attacking, but not this one. At all times, you have one of these four commands highlighted, and the X button confirms that command rather than being dedicated to one mechanic. On top is attack, then magic, then items, and finally summons. If you're playing the 1.5 Remix version anyway, more on that later. Except for attack, each of these commands has a sub-menu that actually houses all the stuff you want. You control where your selection is in the menu with the D-pad during combat, so if you need an item or a certain spell, you either have to take your thumb off the left stick, stopping movement, and menu the item or spell you need, or do an awkward thing with your hands where you control the D-pad and left stick at the same time. It's something you can definitely gain skill in, but I can see why people feel this is a bit of an antiquated system. In order to get to gravity, it takes seven button presses and all that during combat, which is perhaps a little silly. However, I would take this over archaic movement systems or something like that any day. It houses a lot of mechanics in a way that you can grow in and get better at. It is something that separates good KH players from great KH players. It's something that is unique to this game and still is to this day. I mean, I'm fast at menuing, but watching speedrunners do it is pretty fascinating. It means that there is more to combat than simply using the right moves at the right times. There's also mechanical skill involved with pulling that off. And that's pretty cool to me, especially since some of the combat mechanics are less deep than they had the potential to be. That being said, I have to admit that part of why I like this system is probably because of my fondness for it from a nostalgic standpoint. So I came up with an alternative that I think is better. Currently, it takes seven clicks to get to gravity. Here's a system in which all spells, items, and summons will be accessible within two simple button presses. Take a look at this graph from the instructional manual. You may notice that the R2 button is unused and the L2 button's function doesn't need to be on a trigger necessarily. The L1 button has a magic shortcut menu which gives you access to three spells at the press of either X, square, or triangle, while L1 is held. Here's my system. Let's remove the magic shortcut menu and move L2's function down to L1. Now the bumpers are devoted to lock-on mechanics. L2 is now the magic button. Pressing it will pop up a similar menu to the magic shortcut menu, except all of the remaining buttons are customizable. L1, R1, X, square, triangle, and circle can all be customized and any spell can be put into any button to fit the player's preference. But there are seven spells and six buttons, right? Well, double-clicking L2 will act as its own quick cast that can also have any spell assigned to it. Now all spells are two button presses away. The menu toggles on when L2 is pressed and by default goes away when a spell is cast, but an option could be implemented in the customize screen to leave up the menu until you deliberately make it go away by pressing down on the D-pad in order to facilitate spamming spells. If you open the menu and decide you don't want to cast a spell, tapping the down button on the D-pad will make it go away, giving back access to your regular actions like attacking and dodging. I would propose the same thing for items in the R2 button, except instead of having each item in each slot be its own button, we make each item type its own button. Same deal, one for each button and a double tap for the leftover. So if you have three high potions equipped and the high potion type is assigned to X, then you'll use that button combination to use high potions until you run out. Again, now all items are two button presses away. Due to the nature of item usage, this menu will always go away after an item is used. Finally, pressing L2 and R2 at the same time will give access to the summon menu, and the remaining buttons are customizable just like the other menus for the six summons. Naturally, the menu will go away and the summons abilities will be on the triangle button. Finally, X is now just devoted to attacks, and triangle is devoted to situational commands like opening chests and talking to people. 
This system would make accessing all of Sora's moves much easier. While it seems like a lot at first, it's important to remember that the game drip feeds you all of these mechanics over the course of the game. It would teach you how the system works with items at the beginning of the game, and then, when you get magic later on, you'll be pretty aware of how it works and the amount of spells, items, and summons you have access to by the end won't be overwhelming. Would this be better than the system currently in the game? Yeah, probably. I like the command menu, but I can absolutely see why someone wouldn't, and this would be a good alternative. The last aspect of basic combat is the lock-on mechanic. At any time in combat, an orange circle will appear on the nearest enemy to Sora, and his attacks will be directed toward that target. Clicking R1 will put a more permanent lock onto the target, and your camera will adjust to keep them in the center as best as possible. So free attacking is basically impossible due to this system. This sounds like it could be a problem, but it's really not. The lock-on system keeps you from whiffing too easily. It's useful in particular because the camera is difficult to control during combat. So even if you don't have a specific target, your attacks will always be directed at something. Before we switch gears a bit, let's also discuss movement. Sora's basic movement is a little slow and clunky. He has some weight, but he definitely doesn't reflect the Super Mario 64 inspiration in his movement. Luckily, the game doesn't put a ton of emphasis on moving laterally through the worlds beyond fighting, and dodge roll makes up for your limited ability to move quickly when needed. Unfortunately, the game does put an emphasis on verticality and platforming. This is unfortunate because, when the circle button is pressed, it's less like you're telling Sora to jump, and more like you are spawning an invisible spring under Sora's feet which immediately bounces him to the top of his jump, where he stays momentarily before plummeting back to Earth. As far as jumps go, I'll take this one over The Witcher 3, but this game puts a bit too much focus on platforming and verticality for my tastes. It gets a bit better when you require the high jump to be certain, but coincidentally the worlds after that point also have less platforming overall, right down to the last world which is basically no platforming at all. It's a strange decision, but understandable when Super Mario 64 was an inspiration, but this is definitely an aspect we can chalk up to the mistake category. We'll get back to Sora later, now let's switch gears and talk about his combatants. Firstly, Calm and Heartless make up the fights that you will undertake while exploring the world. At the beginning of the game, they start out simple and weak, but each world features a new battle level and tougher enemies, both in stats and in complexity. Let's go over some examples. The first couple worlds will put you up against shadows more often than not. Interestingly, they aren't just chopping blocks to cut through. They have abilities like being able to phase into the ground that makes fighting them slightly more interesting than a standard starter mob. Not that I'd say fighting them is fun, in fact I'd say that the very same ability is the reason I don't like fighting them at all. During that move there is nothing you can do and you just have to wait for them to come back up. Something like this works better when the move completes quickly or you can knock them out of it with a certain spell or something like that. Soldiers appear soon after, they move faster and hit harder than shadows but don't crank up the complexity all that much. After Traverse Town the game starts divvying out enemies more quickly. Red Nocturnes will meet you at Wonderland and they are the first enemies that can cast spells at you. So now we can throw long-range combatants in with those close-ranged ones. Added complexity is whether you decided to dodge their fireballs or time a guard or attack to knock them back, which will stun them pretty much indefinitely. Wonderland also brings fat bellies who can only be attacked from behind and have a desperation phase where they charge at you and usually need to be blocked or parried to be able to get another attack on them. I would group these guys in with some others like the Defenders and their Fire Bandit Brethren into a gimmick enemy category, where simply attacking them won't be enough to beat them. Toward the end of the game we get very complex enemies with lots of different mechanics like the Invisibles and the Angels. Angels are particularly annoying because once they hit a certain health threshold, they go into a mode where they will summon another angel if not taken out quickly enough. The enemies ramp up steadily as the game goes on, from simple and easy to complex and requiring much more focus to defeat, and the curve is pretty solid throughout to keep the mob fights interesting. They fall to the same problem the rest of the game's combat has, which I'll discuss momentarily, but the enemies themselves have great design for the most part. Each new world presents a new boss as well, of varying levels of quality. To be frank, I had this note in my outline, and prior to Hollow Bastion, I had trouble coming up with even one example of a boss that was only good and fun. Pretty much all of them are either annoying or bland. Your mileage may vary, of course. Let's go over some examples. Unfortunately, both fights against Jafar are low points for this game's boss roster. Jafar's first fight sees you in an enormous arena, Strike 1. Jafar's attacks are rarely focused on you and are instead AoEs in the center of the arena, Strike 2, and Jafar regularly flies away from Sora, meaning you must chase him around with the painfully slow movement we discussed earlier, Strike 3. Genie being in the center trying to smack you occasionally doesn't even matter, so it's just a game of chasing Jafar around until he decides to stop and let you attack him. 
He only has a few attacks he cycles through. He'll try and smack you with his staff, he'll shoot a laser ray at you, and he'll summon an ice storm in the center of the arena, which is baffling to me since it's incredibly easy to avoid and leaves him completely open. There's really just nothing interesting happening in this boss, and way too much of it is spent running in a circle while Jafar flies around. And yet, somehow, Genie Jafar is even worse. You can't actually attack Genie Jafar himself, instead you must attack his lamp which Iago carries around the arena. Jafar attacks once every blue moon, so you basically have no chance of dying. You just wail away at the lamp until he's dead. It's a snooze fest to say the least. One more example of a bad boss comes in the form of Ursula's first matchup, in which you have to blast her cauldron with magic before you can effectively attack her. I probably wouldn't mind this too much if it didn't take so much magic to move the phase. So on top of having to have enough MP restoring items to get past the cauldron parts, you also have to contend with Ursula and the eels which are constantly harrying you. This is perhaps the worst example of a gimmick boss in the game, that being a boss that uses some extra mechanic to make the fight more interesting. Usually these are middling in success, but this one tanks the concept by being needlessly frustrating and difficult to get past the gimmick. I would say that this one is another your mileage may vary type boss, because I play melee builds and a boss like this requiring a lot of MP will obviously be more frustrating for me. But even if you are playing a magic focused build, all you're doing is throwing spells at a cauldron and occasionally dodging attacks, so it's still not engaging. The rest of the bosses from the end of Traverse Town 1 to Hollow Bastion are what I would call just okay. They don't do anything particularly interesting, and they don't elevate themselves much at all. I wouldn't expect every boss to be showstoppers, but I was surprised at how many of them were either perfectly serviceable or actually kinda bad, and how few I would consider to be good. Later I will go over each boss in more detail. Alright, let's talk numbers. The progression and RPG elements of Kingdom Hearts are of great importance, as we'll see. Each character and enemy has a pool of stats that heavily affect how combat progresses. Sora's offensive stats are his strength and magic. Let's start with strength. This governs the damage dealt to enemies by standard keyblade strikes, and it's affected by the enemy's defense stat. Both of these are static numbers, but the formula that determines total damage output per strike is dynamic. That formula looks like this. First, the game determines how Sora's strength compares to his enemy's defense stat, with certain factors that can change that outcome, such as the difficulty you are playing on, and if the attack is a critical hit. If that number is below or equal to 8, then damage equals whatever that number is. If it is above 8, then the formula becomes exponential. It becomes 10 times 2 x minus 9 divided by 4, rounded down typically. So you plug the number that you got from simply subtracting defense from strength into this exponential function in order to get the total damage output. So having a significantly higher strength stat than the enemy's defense stat means that you will be dealing a significantly larger amount of damage. This graph shows pretty handily how it ramps up. The difference between 4 points of strength at the bottom of the graph is pretty nominal, but once you get to 14 points and up, the difference becomes much more noticeable, especially on enemies and bosses that allow you to spam attacks quickly. That being said, even before the exponential formula comes into play, small amounts of increased damage can make a huge impact over the course of a battle. I can show this tangibly in my playthrough. When I first got the giant Ursula at the end of Atlantica, I had a difficult time with her. At the time, my strength was 22 and my defense was 18. I went and completed Halloween Town before trying again, and so 6 levels, upgraded gear, and a better keyblade brought my strength up to 26, and my defense up to 22. You've been watching my first attempt. Now here's my second one, where I beat Giant Ursula. See the huge difference? I'm only dealing 4 more damage per strike, not factoring in critical hits which the pumpkin head excels at, but even that much more damage makes a difference in how quickly I can drain her hit bar and the extra 4 points of defense make a huge difference as well because I'm already having damage with arrow and my HP is only 51. The small numbers mean that tiny differences in stats have huge impacts on the way the fight plays out. I think it's pretty easy to see with this example how important strength and defense stats are, and in general how some fights can come down to more of a test of stats than a test of skill. Not every fight is this way. Someone like Riku 2, which we'll discuss momentarily, is much more dependent on your skill as a player, and this is largely because the attacks are well telegraphed and blockable. What you might notice about Giant Ursula is that she is constantly dropping light pillars on your head in a way that is either unavoidable or forces you to stop attacking so you can avoid them. This really does read as a sort of defense check because there is no way to avoid these pillars without taking a very long time to slowly pick off her HP during the one attack phase where she doesn't use these light pillars. Otherwise you just have to tank them so you can actually deal damage. 
It's perhaps a strange decision to me to have an entire world in which you have access to none of your defensive capabilities and you can't even move normally. Because that's how you get these stat check bosses that have little care for player skill beyond timing cures. And this isn't the only time this happens. There are four boss fights like this and, unfortunately, two of them are in the final boss. Is this entirely a bad thing? I don't think it has to be, but it does call into question what the intention for the game was. Considering the team had the most experience with Final Fantasy and turn-based games, of course stats were a huge part of balancing the game properly. And yet some of the bosses are clearly designed so that skill can easily outweigh your stats, at least to a certain extent. Many games that had RPG roots, I'm thinking Mass Effect specifically, but others as well, start in their first installment with a strange hybrid between action combat and stat checks, and it's generally considered poor design. As they expand through their installments, they trend toward action and away from hard RPG elements, meaning skill is more highly rewarded than stats, and the presentation of being an action third-person shooter begins to feel more natural. The Elder Scrolls series has gone through this same evolution over time, though let's not open the can of worms that is whether the combat is well designed in those games. It feels like this first installment had some difficulty finding a balance between stat importance and skill importance. To be clear, the 1.5 re-release, which we'll detail more about later, added an EXP0 ability which means that you can stay at level 1 throughout the game. How does this work in a stats-based game? Well, it kinda doesn't. In order to make it work, the designers made Sora deal a basic amount of damage across the board, but only to bosses. You pretty much can't fight regular enemies at a certain point because your damage will be so low as to become tedious. They also added a modifier to your damage for every finisher you perform, so the damage calculation ends up looking very different. Furthermore, enemies and bosses can only ever deal max HP minus 1 damage, so that when at full HP, you will always survive the first hit, with the exception of certain bosses that deal a third of your health bar with each hit. This is another way to highlight the stats-driven nature of the game, because it is far from balanced if you neuter yourself without the designers giving out freebie hits and higher damage in a way that doesn't comply with how the game was originally designed. The reason this is a bit sticky is because this isn't a turn-based RPG, obviously. Action RPGs involve player skill mechanically, and the problem with this system is that, regardless of player skill, if you find yourself underleveled, the game will brick wall you until you grind enough levels or stat boosts to tackle the challenge. There's an inherent disconnect between what the game is presenting, a challenge that can be overcome through skill alone, and what the game is giving you, a game which requires you to be a certain level or stat number to actually beat enemies and bosses. Now let's talk about magic. MP is the resource that you use to cast spells, and it also governs how strong those spells are, a point of confusion for many players since there is no separate magic attack stat. For some spells, max MP acts as a flat bonus to damage, healing in the case of cure, or time for stop, in a few cases, max MP is multiplied by 2 in order to get the new damage number. Magic spells also come in three variants, given as rewards for story progression mostly. These variants come as straight upgrades over older variants, and not only increase their damage but also their effectiveness as well. For example, Gravaga has a much larger area of effect than Gravity, same with Thundaga and Blizzaga. These spells are, generally speaking, very powerful and can hit numerous enemies at once, making them great for crowd control. Gravity in particular can ravage huge health bars very quickly, even if you aren't specced out for a magic build. The real deciding factor in the balance of a magic system like this is in the resource itself, and this game has an interesting system for restoring MP. The primary way to restore MP beyond items is physical attacks. Each attack will fill up part of this orange bar on the outside of the MP gauge. Once that orange bar overfills to the next point of MP, it resets and you get a point of MP back. It's a little weird to describe, but I think it visually makes sense. The reason that this is interesting is because spells will also consume this orange bar, called MP Charge, as if it were MP. Fire and Blizzard treat MP Charge as if it's actual MP, only consuming one segment of charge per cast. This makes them very spammable and very, very cheap. Other spells require much more MP charge to cast, and if you don't have enough, they will simply take however much MP they cost to cast. It's also important to note that every enemy and boss in the game has a set of resistances and weaknesses, which means certain spells will be more or less effective on them depending. Many bosses have high resistance to basically all magic, meaning that magic builds may have a more difficult time against them, but magic builds will always have the upper hand in mob fights due to crowd controlling spells like gravity and stop, and area of effect spells like thunder and blizzard, so it's somewhat balanced between the two playstyles. But what of balance? Some say balance in single player games is silly because it doesn't matter, if you don't want to use unbalanced mechanics, just don't use them. 
I think it all depends on what the game wants to give you. This question of balance comes up a lot in Elder Scrolls circles, and there it definitely feels like a trend towards overbalancing the experience has hindered the design of the gameplay in combat. The difference with something like Elder Scrolls and something like Kingdom Hearts is that, in Elder Scrolls, you are usually playing as some mystical entity that is, in-universe, very powerful and capable. Morrowind, you are Nerevar incarnate. Oblivion, you are destined to help Martin back to the throne. Skyrim, you are the Dragonborn. It makes sense that there would be really OP mechanics like spell creation in Morrowind or stealth archer in Skyrim because you are canonically very powerful. Of course, you should be able to easily wipe the floor with some random bandits in a cave. In Kingdom Hearts, you are a 14-year-old child who got gifted a key. His lack of capabilities as a Keyblade wielder is reflected in his barbaric fighting style that can be described in many ways, but finesse is not a word I would use. It makes total sense that Sora shouldn't be able to wipe the floor with anyone. So why should the player be able to do that? That's why the balance of this game is important. It doesn't make sense that Sora could demolish Ansem at the end of the game, the person who orchestrated all of the events of the game with little or no challenge. The design of the game largely reflects this, except for the fact that any challenge can be circumvented with level farming. This goes back to the stats versus skill issue that seems to run through everything. While there is a maximum potential damage output that you eventually hit if you go above the expected strength stat for any given boss, 20 damage is still ridiculously high when the toughest boss in the game only has 1800 health. Being overleveled for a challenge itself doesn't call the balance of a game into question because there are systems in place to ensure you stay near the correct level for any given challenge, but the problem here is that just a few levels absolutely kill the challenge, even on the hardest difficulty. You can accidentally overlevel yourself out of a realistic or engaging amount of challenge. And you know, little candid moment here, as I was writing this section I was trying to find the linchpin, the thing that I say to really hammer this home, why the stats versus skill thing really is a problem. And as I was watching back through some of my footage, it hit me. Watch this boss fight. All I am doing is spamming X, jumping occasionally, and healing when I take too much damage. I'm not dodging attacks. I'm really not thinking much about the battle or what I'm doing, just spamming attacks and healing occasionally. Basically what I'm saying is that I might as well be playing a game with turn-based combat. I take my turn to strike, he takes his turn, I heal when I need it. This is why the stats versus skill thing really is a problem. The stats are so important that, even on the highest difficulty this game has to offer, it might as well be a turn-based RPG for all the mechanical skill it is requiring of me. To be clear, not all the bosses are like this, but a surprising amount of them just devolve into mashing X and healing when needed, and that's a pretty big failure for an action RPG. The leveling up system is, obviously, the next most important thing to talk about in regards to the RPG elements. Each level will give you either a boost to strength, HP, MP, or defense. This chart shows what order these come in, although this is probably different for the Final Mix version, but it gives you a good idea of how things are spread out. This chart shows how abilities are spread out as well, but again, this is going to be different depending on your version. The above discussion about overleveling or underleveling is honestly only for extreme cases and high difficulty, because most of the time, the game keeps you at a decent level pace throughout. As you're leveling up, the enemies are also getting stronger, represented by the battle level above every world as you are preparing to travel there. This creates a difficulty curve that requires you to be at a certain level range in order to handle enemy and boss encounters at every new world you travel to. The leveling feels common enough as to not get boring, but spaced out enough in order to remain a satisfying reward. I would expect nothing less of the Final Fantasy devs. Generally speaking, the leveling of enemies only keeps you from going straight to the end without engaging the worlds along the way. It doesn't actually make the enemies significantly harder. That comes in the form of increasing complexity in the enemies and bosses, like I spoke of earlier. The leveling system feels well designed, although this is definitely a feel thing and your mileage is going to vary. A major reason why I like it is because it doesn't require much grinding to stay consistent with the battle level. You do have to fight pretty much all of the Heartless you come across along the way, but if you enjoy the combat that won't be a difficult ask. Good job in this regard, if not a bit undermined by the balance issues present through it. You earn experience for beating enemies and bosses, but it's also important to mention here the tech point system. I mentioned it with the Destiny Islands fights, but it's an ever-present system that rewards certain actions in combat with extra XP. These actions range from hitting elemental enemies with their weak element, like hitting fire bandits with an ice spell, or parrying certain attacks. It's not a lot of XP generally, but it absolutely adds up over time. Performing the action will make this big text pop up, instantly gratifying the player for whatever they just did. 
given that leveling up and keeping ahead of the battle level curve is important in this game, this is a great way to reward the player for more technical play, and it's probably the best system the game has to offer in regards to its combat. One cool thing about tech points is just how many there are. I recently watched a design doc video on this system and saw him pull off a couple that I had never seen in the hundreds of playthroughs I've done. I've talked a bit about how the combat isn't incredibly deep, but this system does encourage the player to get more involved in the combat and experience it in a different way than just button mashing, which is always a great thing. Next up is the abilities, of which there are a lot. Each one takes a certain amount of ability points to equip, which can be increased through items and leveling up. Abilities are earned through leveling up and also through certain events during story completion. The order in which you gain them is dependent on your choice of item at the beginning of the game, and will heavily change the way you perceive the combat. For example, since I picked the shield on my first playthrough, I went through the whole game without getting access to any combo plus abilities, meaning my combo stayed at the standard 3 hit combo it starts out at. On the other hand, I got second chance, which saves you from dying to any one hit if you were over 1 HP, and Leaf Bracer, which makes it so you can't take damage from attacks when casting Cure very early, making the game significantly easier in some ways. Taking the sword is going to increase your physical capabilities much more quickly, as well as giving access to scan early, allowing you to see enemy health values. Taking the rod gives access to MP haste early, allowing you to earn MP from attacking enemies much more effectively. Each playthrough will, by level 100, unlock every ability in the game, but you will have a tougher time in certain aspects in the combat depending on which specialization you picked. The abilities do a great job of allowing you to customize your playthrough, although the customization in this regard ends when you pick your specialization at the beginning. You can't select which abilities you get in which order beyond that point, only which ones to equip. There are four classifications of abilities, Combat, Support, Special, and Shared. Under the Combat umbrella we have some basic ones like Combo and Air Combo Plus which add more attack to your combo. A little more interesting is the counter attack ability, which gives you a unique command after successfully blocking or parrying an attack. Other abilities in this bracket give unique attacks, such as Slapshot, which gives Sora a very quick attack that occasionally deals critical damage. This gets randomly slotted into Sora's opening attacks prior to the finisher. Another is Sliding Dash, which only triggers when at a certain distance from an enemy. Aerial Sweep is much the same, except in the air. Then there are some new finishers. Some of them scale off your magic stat instead of strength and they are all randomly chosen to finish your combo depending on the situation that's happening. For example, if you are surrounded by enemies, the game will be more likely to choose Stun Impact or Ripple Drive over this standard finisher or Zantetsuken, while fighting individual targets will tend to choose Zantetsuken or Blitz over the others, and Hurricane Blast could only be used from the air. There's no strategy to this beyond knowing which ability you should or should not have equipped during any given fight, especially since some of them scale off MP instead of Strength. The game also slots dodge roll and guard into this bracket. A few things about these abilities. Firstly, it can be kind of hard to tell from this footage, but guard is something you have to time. When you press the square button while stationary, Sora throws his keyblade up in a defensive motion briefly, parrying any attacks that might come at him during that time. It only lasts for a bit under a second, and there's a ramp up into the actual defensive state and a ramp down before you can do anything else. This means that guards are pretty easy to punish if improperly timed. The guard also only affects Sora from the front. Any attacks that come at him from the side or behind will break through the guard. Luckily, Sora will automatically turn toward his target when guarding. Dodge Roll is activated with the square button while in motion. It has a decent amount of invincibility frames attached to it, but also moves pretty far, making it viable both to escape and to go through attacks unscathed. The former is safer, but the latter is more rewarding, as it's easier to punish the enemy after their attack is complete. This is pretty standard stuff nowadays, but at the time these details weren't written in stone. Notably, the invincibility frames for dodge roll seem to be front-loaded, meaning the game will more often reward you for waiting till the last second possible before attempting to roll through an attack. The fact that this ability costs AP instead of just being a part of the standard moveset is odd, because your basic run isn't often enough to dodge attacks. You do typically have plenty of AP so that you can just keep dodge roll equipped at all times, but it still strikes as odd in a genre where dodge rolls have become extremely commonplace. Next we have support abilities. The most consistently powerful of the bunch here are Leaf Bracer and Second Chance, which I've already described. When combined, they make the game almost trivial sometimes. Few bosses attack fast enough to follow up on a big attack that triggers Second Chance, and even if they could, Cure is only two button clicks away if you have it in your Magic Quick Select menu, giving you access to all of those invincibility frames for the paltry cost of 1 MP. I even use the ability to sequence break certain bosses, like you're seeing now with Maleficent. 
She's supposed to knock you off her platform numerous times throughout the fight, but using Leaf Bracer means she can't move you and you can continue to attack afterward. It should be noticed that Leaf Bracer was added in the Final Mix re-release that came around a half a year later, which I'm going to devote its own section to. I'm just mentioning it to say that the original game didn't have this broken combination. Moving on, we have some simple abilities like Jackpot, Lucky Strike, and Treasure Magnet, which affect enemy item drops. MP Rage gives you MP Charge when hit during battle, and MP Haste increases the rate at which you gain MP Charge when you attack enemies. Tech Boost gives more XP when earning tech points. Encounter Plus increases the odds of encountering enemies in the field, useful for farming in-game synthesis items, and Cheer increases the summon gauge so summons are more useful. Finally, this bracket includes Scan, which allows you to see enemy health bars, which is quite useful when you have nothing else to look at while you're spamming the X button. Finally, there's Special Abilities. These are the most unique of the bunch because they are all more like a limit break in the Final Fantasy series. They cost anywhere from 2 MP to all remaining MP for the entire party in the case of a Trinity Limit. In the 1.5 version, these are accessed by pressing the triangle button when prompted, and they are triggered from certain in-combat criteria. Back in the day, Strike Raid was the way to get past tough bosses, and this is still largely true. You were entirely invincible during the duration of the move, and it does a ton of damage from a distance. Ars Arcanum, Ragnarok, and Sonic Blade are all solid choices as well, but don't have anything that makes them exceptionally better than Strike Raid. Finally, Trinity Limit is a powerful blast that hits all the enemies in the area and does more damage the more MP it consumes from Sora. Completely useless in bosses, but nice for the millionth mob fight just to move things along. The final bracket, Shared, are abilities you get through story progression, and they are shared between all party members since they are all movement augments. You get High Jump after getting halfway through Monstro, you get Glide for beating Neverland, you get Super Glide for beating Chernabog toward the end of the game, and just for the sake of completeness, you get Dolphin Kick during Atlantica and can only use it there. There are even certain areas you can't get to until you have High Jump, Glide, or both. Locking story and exploration progress behind grabbing abilities that are rewarded for progress? Guys, I think Kingdom Hearts might be a Metroidvania. Really though, these abilities that expand your movement are great additions, especially when the basic movement is so dull. Other ways to customize your playstyle are keychains and accessories. Keychains are given as rewards, typically for completing worlds or doing certain actions throughout the game. Each one boasts a description, which helps to determine which one you should use. Early on, you will basically always be equipping the next keyblade you get, as they make a huge difference to damage output even when the bonus to strength is only one point. Later on, you will be making decisions based on each keyblade's particular strengths and what you want to be better in. Many keyblades focus on improving either your strength or your MP, and also have different capabilities in regard to your critical hit chance. The actual amounts of these are hidden, but are readily available online. All Keyblades have a base 20% critical hit chance when not specifically changed to be higher or lower, and on critical hit, the Keyblade adds strength to your attack, anywhere from 2 to 16 points depending on the keychain. Important to note here that there is a hard damage cap above 55, so any strength above that point will actually become useless, meaning that critical chance and strength added become less important as time goes on. There are also two other hidden mechanics tied to each Keyblade that have a big effect on how they feel to use. The first is only kind of hidden, but it's actually the length of the Keyblade itself. On one extreme here we have the Fairy Harp, or the Lady Luck, which are very, very short. On the other extreme is the Metal Chocobo, which has an enormous range at the cost of having a 2% critical hit chance. Most Keyblades fall somewhere in between, but the length really does have a large effect on your physical capabilities in battle. Short Keyblades tend to make up for their length with excellent boosts to magic or summon power and increase your MP by a pretty good amount, but you'll be much more likely to whiff attacks with the neutered length. The other, truly hidden mechanic tied to Keychains is their recoil. This modifier determines how well you will be able to recover if knocked off balance, either by striking something you can't deal damage to like a Defender's Shield or a Fat Belly's Belly, or by guarding against a particularly strong attack. Furthermore, the lower this stat, the more likely a really powerful attack from an enemy will be able to break your own guard. Here's some visual examples. Some Keyblades such as the Diamond Dust have a 1 to recoil, and I can't even block Riku's attacks here properly. To contrast, the Metal Chocobo and a few other Keyblades have a recoil stat of 90, so not only does my block hold, I can quickly go into an attack in retaliation. This is a stat that is really fascinating to me, but generally does not have as heavy an influence on combat as strength or MP. The only time I consider it is when getting to Riku here, where I can do this with the counterattack, and it's just really satisfying. 
There are a slew of accessories that can be acquired throughout the game, whether in chests or as rewards for completing certain criteria. Each one has unique properties, can increase HP, defense, strength, MP, AP, or resistance to certain types of damage. The latter is generally not as important as the other stats, especially AP, MP, and strength. These allow you to change your playstyle pretty much at will. If you get a hankering to play a more magic-focused Sora, you can switch out your accessories for those with higher boosts to MP in order to make that playstyle more viable. In fact, really optimizing this game would probably look like switching to MP-focused accessories for mob fights and back to strength-focused accessories for boss fights, since so many bosses have high resistance to magic anyway. Since you can switch at any time between battles, these can easily become something you micromanage depending on what's coming up. That is, if you know what's coming up, of course. Many bosses give powerful accessories as rewards. These are always a joy to grab and try to slot into your loadout somewhere. The nature of the system, however, means that you will basically always be sacrificing something anytime you change accessory loadouts, whether that be a crucial boost in AP so you can equip something like the very expensive Leaf Bracer or a boost to defense that was helping to keep you alive. It's good, I like it, not much else to say here. Throughout the game, you will pick up a number of little items that will make you wonder if there is a crafting system in this game, sort of like in past Final Fantasy entries. And as it turns out, you can unlock Synthesis after Agrabah in tandem with unlocking the Green Trinity Mark. You can craft a number of different items, from potions and elixirs to accessories and the Ultima Weapon, the strongest weapon in the game. As far as crafting systems are concerned, this one doesn't really come to fruition until you get to the end game. Unlike accessories or abilities, this system is far from necessary to experience the game, and if I'm being honest, it doesn't really do much outside of being a checklist for 100 percenters. This is especially true in Final Mix, where the game puts the EXB earring in the first batch of synthesis items as well as a few other things that need items that you will certainly not come in contact with until you've beaten the game, and even if you do, you probably won't be strong enough to handle getting them until a decent way into the endgame. The problem here is that you have to craft a certain number of items in each synthesis tier before unlocking more of them, so you won't be able to unlock them all until in-game anyway. This combined with the fairly low drop rates of most of the synthesis items basically confirms that Square saw this system as something you didn't really do until after the last boss anyway. Nothing wrong with that, but given that the items within are pretty useless beyond the added EXP increasing items from Final Mix, it really is just a checklist so you can get the Ultima weapon and 100% the game. Bit of wasted potential there. Finally, in the gameplay mechanic overview, yes, finally, we have partners. At basically all times, you will have two people fighting alongside you, whether that be Donald, Goofy, or whoever is tied to the Disney World you were hanging out at. If you have access to three party members, you can swap one out for another at any save point across the game. They are completely AI controlled, except that you can technically tell them to attack the enemy you have targeted by pressing the triangle button during combat, though I have never heard of this actually being used. They can absolutely deal some damage, especially when they get access to special abilities. Speaking of that, Donald and Goofy have their own unique set of abilities, which is great. Some of them are focused on helping the character deal damage, and some are focused on a certain aspect of combat that the character excels at. For example, Goofy has high strength and defense, but he also has a specialization in supporting other party members with his MP. The MP Gift ability allows Goofy to spend 1 MP to restore 3 MP to a party member, his best ability in the original game by far. The Final Mix version adds evolution to his moveset, allowing him to spend 3 MP to restore 30 HP to the whole party, debatably even better than MP Gift depending on the needs of the party. While Donald Duck doesn't get any unique abilities, he has access to all of your spells, and is very strong in that regard. And no, you won't be hearing the old Donald please heal me meme from me because I know about the customize menu. In here, you can tell the AIs how you want them to behave. Options range from how active in battle they will be to how often Donald will use offensive spells versus defensive spells versus support spells, and so on. I typically set Donald to not use offensive spells too much so he can heal me more often if I need it, which I often do on proud mode. After getting Leaf Bracer and Second Chance, you can comfortably set him back to being offensive because he is quite strong when you want him to be. The Disney partners also tend to be very strong when they feel like pulling their weight, and each also has a customized menu if you really want to get anal about how the AI behaves. Standouts are Ariel, who can drain enemy health bars in seconds, Tarzan, who makes Clayton less frustrating on his own, and Beast, whose name is incredibly apt. The partners are pretty solid, but other than hoping and wishing Goofy will restore your MP or Donald will heal you when you need it, they kind of just do their own thing. It is satisfying to see how much damage they do once you have scan, though.
All right, so now I'm going to quickly rock through all these bosses we haven't talked about yet up until Hollow Bastion, which is where we will pick up with the beat by beat analysis. Trickmaster of Wonderland is a somewhat chaotic boss. Unlike most of the enormous targets in this game, the challenge here is figuring out when and how to strike him. You can sort of hit him from the ground if Sora does the upward strike as the first hit in the aerial combo, but for the most part you have to jump off the table or one of the other items in the arena to get at him, which he also has the ability to remove from the battle. Other than that, he just sort of walks around and attacks really slowly. The main thing you need to watch out for is when he launches fireballs at you with his flaming batons. It's fun, but not my favorite. It gets tedious having to constantly jump up onto the table in order to reliably hit him. He really doesn't do much of anything otherwise. Cloud is up next in Olympus, and he's not exactly a fair fight. His attacks are powerful enough that even if you have guard, his dash attacks will always knock you over, making it difficult to retaliate. Parrying his triple swipe is the most reliable way to make an opening for yourself, and his jump attack has a habit of homing in on you so quickly that it feels impossible to dodge, and it does a ton of damage. Luckily, this is another fight that can be lost without getting a game over. Also in Olympus is Cerberus. This is another boss with long periods of waiting for him to make himself open. He launches various attacks at you from above, and then eventually goes into his physical attack phase, where he hunkers down and lets you hit him in between bites. This is, uh, boring. The attacks that come at you in between phases have basically no chance of hitting you, so it's just waiting for him to decide he's done. Even worse is once he gets to his desperation phase, where he can use this long attack twice in a row. Not exceptional. Sabor is decent, but doesn't do much interesting. Most of their attacks will knock you off balance if blocked, so getting an opening is slow and difficult. Sabor is really only a mini-boss though, the real boss of Deep Jungle is Clayton and his pet stealth sneak. Clayton himself uses a gun, which is difficult to dodge because it's technically hit scan. If you dodge at the right time, you can have it hit you during the invincibility frames, but otherwise it's hard for him to miss. But luckily, Clayton is very easy to stun lock with attacks, so his attacks aren't the ones you need to worry about. His Heartless Companion hits much harder and much more often, and Clayton starts the battle off riding it, so you have to do a certain amount of damage in order to knock him down and get a chance to attack him directly. Without the Heartless, this would definitely be a pushover fight. The way it is now, this is one of those brick wall bosses for a lot of new players since you don't get cure until after him. Clayton is very good at sniping you right after tossing a healing item into the air. Having both of him and the Heartless in the arena means it's tough to pop off an item to heal and even if you do, Clayton will probably end up doing the same thing, prolonging the battle even more. It's tough but hectic in a way that is fun to me. Opposite armor appears to be just a rehash of guard armor at first, but after a moment he flips himself over and becomes more agile. He's uh, a lot easier than guard armor and doesn't attack as quickly for some reason. He spends less time split up too. Really strange. Then we move to Aladdin. We've got Pot Centipede. This guy rarely attacks directly, not to say he can't kill you. There are two targets with separate health bars. The head does occasionally swipe at you with its antenna, whereas the tail just drags its antenna all around, damaging you if you come in contact with the spicy bit at the end. The pot spiders in the area will try to join the train. I'm honestly not sure if there's a bad thing that's associated with more pot spiders being in the conga line, but after enough damage they fall out and the centipede will take a while to join back up before it can start moving consistently. It's a decent boss, but it really is another that devolves into button spam. This boss also uses a version of the Agrabah city that is interconnected rather than separated by loading zones. Kinda neat. Then there's the Cave of Wonders entrance, which comes alive and attacks you before you enter it. Its main form of attack is spawning in enemies to harry you, and it can also shoot little beams of light that seek you out. You have to get rid of the darkness from its eyes and that's it, so it really is just a game of getting up onto the head and smacking the eyes until the fight's over. Not much interest in this one. And we've already been over how awful Jafar is. Next is Monstro in the Parasite Cage. You have to jump to hit his belly, making it very difficult to dodge his attacks if he uses them during your offense. On the other hand, he attacks almost constantly, making this one of those bosses that sort of requires you to throw out any sense of strategy and just wail if you don't want it to take forever. Not this game's best showing for sure. Parasite Cage 2 doesn't fare much better, except now you have less freedom to move, so... He adds this acid spit attack that can easily kill you on higher difficulties, so slower play is required, but it's still just like trading hits. Ursula 1 and 2, check. Next up is Oogie Boogie. What's that? I skipped over Lock, Shock, and Barrel? I don't even know how to analyze this boss because they are so small that I couldn't tell you what they even do beyond running around and occasionally hitting me. Locke spins around basically the whole time, which is a little more uh, quantifiable, I guess. Or is that shock? I don't know. I've died to this boss a bunch before, but it's just kind of whatever. Now, Oogie Boogie. He tosses dice down into his arena, and depending on the outcome of the dice roll, it will send a string of attacks at you before letting you hit these buttons in order to get up to Oogie and attack him directly. 
Do this like six times or so and the boss is over. You can knock the dice away in order to ensure the roll won't be high, which is great because things do get a little crazy when he rolls high. If you manage to hit all three dice, then it completely skips Oogie's offensive phase and lets you get another shot at attacking, which is super cool. This is a neat boss, and for some reason, the waiting period in between openings doesn't bug me as much as the other bosses. Though I don't have any real explanation as to why. After this boss, Oogie Boogie turns into his mansion, and you have to kill all these black orbs in order to finish the fight. This one isn't much to write home about. It's simple and goes by pretty quickly with little issue. On to the last world before Hollow Bastion, Neverland. Shadow Sora starts us off. He's a copy of Sora's basic moveset with a couple heartlessy additions. He can split up into multiple versions and you have to find the real one, and he can disappear into the floor and pop up to attack you. This guy has a similar feeling to many copycat bosses in other games. They attack exactly the same as you, so you'll end up matching attacks a lot. He leaves a lot of openings for you to wail on him though, so it's not too bad. This one keeps up a decent pace and requires you to pay attention to the battle, so it's on the better side of the decent. Last but not least is Captain Hook. He attacks with basically no warning, and there are some heartless flying around to cause you grief, although they don't usually end up affecting the battle too much. His attacks are fast and frantic and regularly knocks you off balance. All of this actually makes him a tough fight, and one that requires some attention to get past. Hitting him with certain spells causes unique effects, some of them detrimental, some as fire, which causes him to run around the arena sporadically and he can damage you if he bumps into you during this time. He's pretty good. I think the correlation with these later bosses being better than the earlier ones is caused by the later bosses ramping up in difficulty, adding more mechanics and punishing you for button spamming more often. I still wouldn't say that any of them so far have been good bosses, strictly speaking, but some of them can be fun at least. There's one more element to the gameplay I want to discuss prior to moving on to other things, and that's the gummy ship. This thing is your mode of transportation from world to world, and you do that through this on-rail space shooting minigame thing. I used to think this sucked, like, a lot. Even as a kid, I thought these sucked. They are boring, slow, and they basically have no chance of killing you, which is a blessing because at least then you don't have to go back to the beginning and waste so much of your time again. Presentation-wise, space is just full of random blobs and colorful boulders in these rings. It's uninspired and bland. I still believe that last part. The first bit, I didn't change my tune on until I did my first playthrough for this video. I decided for the first time in the past 20 years for some reason, that I was going to actually customize my ship before every new world. My eyes were open to an experience I didn't know was possible. The ship felt better to control, it had more firepower, and I was flying so fast that I had to have cut the time I spent in these missions in half. This time around I legitimately enjoyed the gummy ship missions. They didn't inspire glee in me or anything like that, but they were actually honest to goodness fun, and I don't know why I kept this from myself for so long. I still kind of hate the controls for customizing the ship. This should not be so difficult, and it's kind of hard to describe why it jams my brain, but if you've ever played with the gummy ship in this game, you probably know what I mean. Also, not sure where else to put this, but the backgrounds for the gummy ship missions become darker and more ominous as you get further into the game, ending in an almost completely dark void prior to the final world, which is really cool. Each world presents a new challenge, not only in enemies and bosses, but also in the level design and navigating the levels. Each world consists of numerous zones that are separated by loading breaks. Each zone is designed to have a few different potential combat areas where fights can commence. Generally speaking, the fighting arenas don't have any verticality or anything like that. The fights often take place on flat, open plains. A few exceptions to this would be the second district from Traverse Town, some areas of Hollow Bastion, most of the city of Agrabah, and of course, the entirety of Atlantica, which is fought in a three-dimensional plane. I don't necessarily think this is a blunder by any means. When you consider that this is the first action RPG and you look at the RPGs that came before, at least you don't get thrust into different rooms for the fight. The fact that they happen right on the overworld map is a solid detail and the fights themselves don't feel like they lack anything due to the lack of verticality or interactive environments. Occasionally in the levels we get some light puzzle elements. Hollow Bastion is the best example with this moving door puzzle that you need to get past in order to make progress. It's pretty rare that these pop up though, but slightly less rare is having to search around the world to find out how to unlock progress. In Agrabah, there's this pillar stopping you from getting to Jafar, and you have to figure out how to get rid of it. Atlantica has something similar with this weird stone behind a wrecked ship. Each world has something like this, so it's not just a continual string of mob fights and hitting loading zones. That being said, the biggest and most consistent design philosophy used in basically every world in the game after Traverse Town is the maze-like structure of the areas. The first example of this is in Wonderland. In the forest area, there are doors that take you back to the bizarre room, except you don't know what wall you will be on, with no way to know prior to walking in. It can be very difficult to know where you are going, and so I used to spend a long time meandering about in this world until I finally found the right door 
to hit the next bit of progress. Every world that is difficult to navigate like this makes sense. Wonderland is a crazy nonsense world where doors could take you anywhere. Deep Jungle is a literal jungle, so getting lost is almost to be expected. Agrabah is a dense city with towering buildings all over the place. Monstro is a whale. Captain Hook's pirate ship is a tightly interconnected ship with lots of entrances and exits that go to the same place you were just at. Hollow Bastion is an enormous castle and dungeon with a bunch of different ways to get around. I'm glad that it makes sense, but that doesn't dissuade the fact that it's still annoying that almost every single world is a maze that will get you lost on the first go. To make matters worse, there's no waypoint system, no signposting to direct you around, and once the previous cutscene that tells you what you're supposed to be doing next ends, oftentimes there will be no feasible way to get that information again. This means that, as you are exploring around these worlds that are specifically designed to be confusing to navigate, you may not even fully understand what you're supposed to be doing. This is a recipe for frustration, and it's a pretty big failure in my opinion. Adding some sort of system that reminds you what you're doing would make the problem better. Maybe not all the way to a waypoint or mini-map pointing you around, but a small blurb on the paw screen with your current objective would be a great addition, even if it's still a little vague. To be clear, I think this game was designed around the idea that you're going to get lost a lot. The longer you spend in a world, the more enemies you will be fighting, the more levels you will gain, the better the game can keep you at the right battle level. I don't get lost in this game anymore, and in fact, I tend to play in a way that takes me through as few mob fights as possible, and that's why I was a bit underleveled when I got to Giant Ursula. If I had been spending on average another 15 minutes or so in each world fighting mobs and finding my way through, I think I would have been at a better battle level for the boss on the first go. I would still argue that this isn't a good thing. The game shouldn't have been designed to keep you lost for so long, because being lost or aimlessly walking around is rarely fun, even if you enjoy the combat. But what about the exploration? Is it actually any good? Well, the worlds are just small enough to be uninteresting to explore on their own, although this may be something that I literally can't objectively analyze because I know the layout of these worlds better than the layout of my own house. That being said, I really do feel as though there isn't anything to really see or do in these worlds beyond the combat and story progression available there. No interesting locations to see, practically no one to talk to, nothing but mazes and heartless. It seems like a waste to me. These worlds are decently large, but rarely feel inhabited in any way, even when they should, like in the case of Halloween Town in Agrabah. Perhaps you could argue that everyone is sheltering in place because of the Heartless Menace, but they could have included some more safe zones with people to chat with, like the First District in Traverse Town to somewhat solve the problem. As it stands, many of the areas of the game just feel like they are there to give the illusion of size and scope, but they really only serve to make the worlds feel even smaller than they already are. This is actually a similar issue to how the Disney stories are handled. These worlds look very similar to what is presented in the movies they come from. There is no doubt that Disney is great at developing worlds visually and through events which take place. But it seems to me that the devs stopped at recreating the worlds and forgot that a lot of what makes them alive in the original movie is the people that are there, even the really unimportant ones with no lines at all. Sure, they look great, but without the human element, they are dull and, frankly, boring. So there may not be flavor reason to explore, but the game does reward exploration in other ways. Treasure chests are positively littered around like trash on the side of an American highway. They are satisfying finds and opening them gives us a cute animation of Sora tapping it open with the keyblade. This, like anything that is taken care of with a situational command, can't be performed during combat, so you have to clear out the area if you want a specific chest. The actual content of these chests varies from exciting, like finding another group of Dalmatian puppies, to pretty uninteresting, like finding a basic battle item or a gummy block that you don't care about. There are even some chests that contain incredibly useful stuff, like another upgrade to one of your spells or a new keychain. This is the only real reason to explore in my eyes. They are a positive addition and handled very well, even if some of them are a bit boring. On top of chests, there are Trinity Marks scattered around. They come in five different versions and you unlock the ability to engage with each over the course of the adventure. To use them, you have to have Donald and Goofy in your party, so sucks to suck if you like to use the world-specific party members. You start with Blue, where Sora, Donald, and Goofy jump up into the air and make items appear when they hit the ground, and it progresses from there to stuff like creating a tower or slamming their bodies into walls and whatnot else. Though, items in chests are not the only tricks these Trinity Marks have up their sleeve. Some of them will warp you to different locations or unlock alternate pathways for more goodies. These feel even more rewarding than the chests because of their animations and their varied styles of rewards, as well as their rarity. I love these systems for successfully incentivizing exploring the worlds beyond the immediate pathway that you have to take for progression. While I'm on the topic, chests hold the progression to two different side quests. The first is the one I mentioned previously, the Dalmatian puppies. At Traverse Town, the Dalmatians from 101 Dalmatians have lost all their puppies and they've been locked in 
treasure chests scattered across the worlds. Who did this and why? Cruella de Vil isn't in this game, so there's no one that even cares about these guys. If this was in any way an important plot point, it'd be a doozy, but luckily it doesn't matter. My suspicion is that they were scattered when their world was destroyed, and the devs only put them into the chest because otherwise, they would have had to animate the Dalmatian puppies diegetically for when you find them, instead of just popping up a message saying you found them. These guys give rewards after finding a certain amount of puppies and returning to their house in Traverse Town. A fun addition to the chest system, and a good reason to revisit Traverse Town every now and again. The other side quest that progresses through chests is the 100 Acre Wood. The second time you go to Traverse Town, you end up talking to Merlin the wizard and returning an old raggedy book to him. This book has lost many of its pages and they can be found throughout the worlds in chests. You can enter the book and find Winnie the Pooh, who doesn't know where his friends went when their pages were ripped out of the book. The story here is innocuous and peaceful and plays out over the course of the game as you find more pages. In reality, it's just a collection of mini games. Stop Tigger from jumping on carrots, protect Winnie as he collects honey, or do a platforming gauntlet of sorts. Each page gives you a reward when you complete it, and completing the whole thing gives you an upgrade to your stop spell. The mini games are, well, annoying, frankly. They are slow, boring, and too many of them focus on platforming, which is this game's weakest mechanic. The story is cute, at least. Let's now transition into talking about this game's presentation. It'll mostly be judged based off the HD remaster, but for the sake of clarity, I will be showing footage from the original version as well. Graphically, the game boasts vibrant colors and lots of creativity in how it presents its settings. I've already spoken about how great the opening cutscene looks, and the rest of the game holds up pretty well also. Some elements, like the effect of making the shore look soaked as the ocean recedes, don't exactly hold up, but most of these elements are small things that only add detail to the already nicely rendered worlds. I think that, in the context of what came out in 2002, this game looks really solid. Animations are fluid and expressive, most of the time anyway. Sometimes in the cutscenes the characters are just standing around statically, which is fine occasionally. When the animations want to, however, they can really portray some character. A few standout moments are Sora's big smile, when Donald and Goofy are blasted through the air, and Leon's little miffed look here if you beat his fight. Animations outside of the cutscenes are also really great, although I'm still not sure why Sora lifts his legs so high when he jumps. I've already spoken briefly about Sora's attack animations. They are great at conveying his character and his ability as a Keyblade wielder, or lack thereof. As the game goes on and you get new abilities, you can see his animations begin to convey that he's becoming more comfortable with the blade. His strength is reflected not only in your capabilities in combat, but also in the animations as well. Enemy animations are incredibly bouncy most of the time. The Heartless are buoyant and chaotic and entertaining to watch. One area where these animations tend to fail is in enemy telegraphs. Many attacks in this game, especially with bosses, come without much tell. The animations look great, but in the context of an action RPG, it often helps for the animation tells for attacks to be larger than life in a sense, and often these are a little more understated than I would like. It's crazy to me how good the Heartless in this game look. All their designs are incredibly creative, expressive, and unique. You can tell what world each one is from just by looking at them. There's a cohesion between the enemy designs and the level designs that is really satisfying. A few standouts for me are the soldiers, both in animation and design, the defenders, especially how they enter the battle, and the fat bellies, just because they're so comical, they remind me of Big the Cat. Let's talk about sound design now. I typically cringe at Japanese video games in this department, the most recent example being the short stint I spent in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Voices are dry and overly loud, footsteps are weirdly mixed, the battle barks are used too often. <laughs> this is a one-time gig. When it's done, we're done. I'm happy to say that Kingdom Hearts only falls into one of these bits. Footsteps, even in cutscenes, are appropriately mixed in relation to the camera. Voices sound like they are actually in the space the characters inhabit. Hey, I thought... That leaves just one place. Ambient noise is applied when applicable to give the music something to sit with. In game, there are a ton of cool details that you can pick up on. Each keyblade has a unique hit sound, from the clunky wooden thunk of the toy sword to the metallic symbol like crash of the oblivion. 
feedback for attacks is potent in both weightiness and audible impact. This attention to detail makes it a little strange that enemies don't really make any noises other than when they are struck. One notable exception is the stealth sneak that regularly chirps and trills when you're fighting it. More of the enemies could have used this type of thing, these battle barks that give them more personality. Speaking of battle barks, Sora has one every single time you attack. every single time. It's not annoying to me because I've been conditioned to it over many years, and it's not unique in the Japanese game scene, but it's definitely something I can see grinding someone else's gears. Your partners have them too, much less frequently though. In fact, they serve a purpose, because if a party member uses an item or ability that targets someone else in the party, they will call out who it is, which is really handy. I've spent many moments running around waiting to hear Donald call out Sora, because that meant he was gonna heal me finally. Hey, I guess that meme did make it in here. Voice acting is pretty solid for the most part, at least for the original characters. A young Haley Joel Osment plays Sora and does a solid job of portraying the plucky teen. No, this huge black thing swallowed me up. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't... Ow. Hayden Panettiere as Kyrie does a fine job, but I don't think she really had enough time to explore her voice for the character. It's pretty one-dimensional. I told you before, I don't remember. Nothing at all? Nothing. You ever want to go back? Hmm, well, I'm happy here. Really? David Gallagher plays Riku and does a decent job. Sometimes he's the stiffest of the bunch. So, I guess I'm the only one working on the raft. <laughs> and you're just as lazy as he is. But he has his moments. What? The door is open, Sora. Now we can go to the outside world. What are you talking about? We've got to find Kyrie. Kyrie's coming with us. Once we step through, we might not be able to come back. We may never see our parents again. There's no turning back. But this may be our only chance. We can't let fear stop us. I'm not afraid of the darkness. Billy Zane is an absolute standout as Ansem. His voice portrays all the nuance that character deserves. His lines are positively dripping with evil, and it's great. Take a look at this tiny place. To the heart-seeking freedom, this island is a prison, surrounded by water. And so this boy sought out to escape from his prison. He sought a way to cross over into other worlds, and he opened his heart to darkness. So you have come this far, and still you understand nothing. Every light must fade. Every heart return to darkness! Then for the non-original characters, there's a mix of the original voice actors and some... Mm, sound-alikes, to use a slightly incorrect term. Mickey, Donald, and Goofy are voiced by Wayne Alwyn, Tony Anselmo, and Bill Farmer, respectively. They're original voice actors, and they do exactly as good a job as you would expect, which is to say, great. Now, Sora, let's close this door for good! Watch the crack! But... Don't worry. There will always be a door to the light. Sora, you can trust King Mickey. Now, they're coming. Donald, Goofy, thank you. Robert Costanzo plays Phil in Olympus Coliseum, but I don't know. I feel like he's phoning it in. I've always thought he was a sound alike. Good timing. Give me a hand, will you? Move that pedestal over there for me. I gotta spruce this place up for the games. I know it's hard to live up to Robin Williams, but Dan Castellaneta still falls short of what I would expect as Genie. Okay, you asked for it. A hundred servants and a hundred candles loaded with gold. Just say the word and I'll deliver it in 30 minutes or less or your meal's free. Hey, I'll even throw in a cappuccino. <laughs> no thanks. It's almost sad some of these people didn't get musical numbers when you've got incredible voices like Jody Benson and his Ariel and Pat Carroll as Ursula. Oh, I didn't want this! Why not? Aren't you tired of following your dear daddy's orders? That's about it as far as standouts are concerned, but I do have one more thing to mention. Mandy Moore, of all people, plays Aerith, the character with, like, no lines. To be fair, this is definitely prior to her career taking off. In fact, this was eight years before she would play Rapunzel in Tangled. This is incredibly ironic and hilarious for a reason that I won't mention again for probably a couple years or so. In cutscenes, the game is more stringent with its music. Some scenes go by without much music at all, but when it does have it, it's typically something to take note of. 
Some favorite examples of mine are how when Dive to the Heart, the music builds to a climax as the tension grows for the ensuing boss fight. This is one cohesive track called Dive to the Heart, which builds in volume and complexity as it goes, tied to your progression through the tutorial. It contrasts longer melodies with this rapturous cello line and these repeating quick motifs that add anxiety and intrigue. It all builds to a head right as Darkseid shows himself. Gosh, I wish this boss lived up to that intro. The game uses a lot of slow piano tunes to track cutscenes with a lot of thought and introspection, like the piece Treasured Memories when Sora remembers about him and Kairi making cave drawings. But then when someone interrupts him, it quickly switches to this disturbed piece called Strange Whispers. Tied to the darkness soon to be completely eclipsed. The music gives us a taste in these moments of the darker tones that we'll be experiencing throughout the game. On the more playful side are the songs we get during the opening Donald and Goofy scene, such as A Walk in Andante Order. and the Mickey Mouse Club March, which actually comes from an old TV show called Mickey Mouse Club. Three songs on the OST get devoted to Kairi. This melody comes up anytime we focus on her. What do you mean? Well, hmm. you okay? The cutscene music does a great job of raising the impact of the cutscenes when they are used, but what about music and gameplay? There are two kinds of gameplay tracks when in the worlds. Each world has an overworld track, which plays while exploring and during many of the cutscenes while you're there. These range from playful and silly like the piece Welcome to Wonderland, to a little more sinister such as in Captain Hook's pirate ship. Generally speaking, they do a great job of supporting the tone each world goes for. Some of them are originals to this game, while some of them, like the songs Under the Sea and This is Halloween, are actually borrowed from the movie that world came from. Each world also has a battle theme that merges somewhat seamlessly as mob fights commence during the travels. And then back into the overworld theme when the enemies are gone. The effect is certainly functional, but we've come a long way from the way these songs are mixed in terms of implementing dynamic music systems into games. It's not as bad as, say, Oblivion, but it's still not phenomenal. The problem here is that the music always starts up at the same point in the song, a few seconds after the start of it. So you'll be hearing the same 15 to 30 second section of the overworld and battle themes dozens of times during your stay at any given world. Exacerbated if you want to go for 100% completion since you'll be spending a lot of time ambling about in these worlds. These battle themes are pretty good on their own though. They are chaotic and energetic and use the theme of the world in a different way. Here's a couple examples from the worlds we haven't listened to yet. On top of the battle themes, many of the worlds have their own boss theme as well. The first unique boss theme comes in Destiny's Force, which we get during the second fight with Darkseid.
Once we get to Guard Armor, we get Shrouding Dark Cloud, a very frantic song with lots of quick melodies over a steadier bass line. Next is the piece Squirming Evil from the fight with Clayton, a little darker and more sinister piece with a big emphasis on percussion. These songs get reused for many of the bosses going forward until we get to Giant Ursula, whose fight is underscored by the Deep End, one of my favorite boss themes in the game. There's a few more, but I'm going to reserve talking about them for the time being until we get to their implementation in the story. Last but certainly not least, I can't talk about Kingdom Hearts music without talking about the song that made me make this video. Dearly Beloved greets you every time you boot up the game. It's an incredibly simple song, a piano melody slowly and methodically played over a pad of choir in the background. In the menu you can hear the sounds of a shoreline lapping up onto a beach, flowing around Sora's feet. It's a short loop, three chords and eight measures repeated infinitely, and yet somehow it encapsulates everything this game is to me. The melody is simultaneously soothing and disturbed, simple and complex. It's quiet and calm, but it feels like there's something more underneath, something waiting to get out from beyond the repeating notes. Following every step of the melody are these small, almost inaudible high notes that do so little and yet add so much. The left hand is written in straight rhythms, giving both context and contrast to the more sporadic right hand line that features just as many trills and offbeat motions as it does the alternative. I don't know, maybe I'm just really nostalgic for this song and it's making me hear things that aren't there. I mean, I know that's true. But maybe hearing me talk about it like this will give even those that aren't fans of the series an understanding of why I love it so much. This song is the perfect picture of the series, and breaking my rule of not talking about future games for a moment, this song has been here since the beginning and hasn't left yet. Every single game in the series opens with a rendition of this song, and most of them reuse it for their final screen after beating the game and watching the credits, the perfect bookend. It's agonizingly beautiful, and I hope I'm getting that across. Kingdom Hearts is something special, something unique and incredible. I'm envious of people that haven't experienced it yet, but I also know that I'm blessed to be able to hold it in my heart for so long. So even as I criticize it, which I already have and will continue to do, I think I can always go back to the song and remember why I love this series, why it's become a part of me. Let's catch back up with our intrepid travelers. During their first outings to the worlds, they end up accidentally closing two keyholes, doors to the heart of the world in question. We are told that Heartless are coming from the keyholes and closing them should resolve the issue. Occasionally we will see a glimpse into the villain's plans, including a resolution to who took Alice. It was Maleficent. We learn that they are trying to collect the seven princesses of heart, but the purpose of which is still shrouded from us. During the second visit to Traverse Town, we end up running into an old friend. The visit is short-lived, however, as we see Maleficent talking to Riku, manipulating him into believing something that is... While you toiled away trying to find your dear friend, he quite simply replaced you with some new companions. Evidently, now he values them far more than he does you. Debatably true. From this point on, Sora's goal shifts from primarily finding Riku and Kairi to closing keyholes with Donald and Goofy. If Riku is afraid that he's been replaced with someone else, and that Sora doesn't care to find him anymore, he's not entirely wrong. Later, Sora and Riku meet once again in the belly of Monstro, where Riku remarks on Pinocchio as being a heartless puppet, something he says could help someone else that's missing their heart. Finally, we see Riku again on Captain Hook's ship, where we also find Kairi, who isn't acting like herself. Riku continues to put Sora down for his current goal. Well, where are Donald and Goofy? Are they that important to you? More important than old friends? Instead of worrying about them, you should be asking about her. 
Kyrie. That's right. While you were off goofing around, I finally found her. And again, I can't say that he's wrong. Sora hasn't mentioned Riku or Kairi at all since Deep Jungle, unless he's in Riku's presence. He has completely forgotten the original goal he had to find his childhood friends. He obviously has a higher calling now that he has the Keyblade, but Riku being upset is completely justified. We have to go back to Traverse Town one more time to get our ship upgraded before we can continue, and during that time, Sora has a vision of Kairi in a library talking to an older woman, describing the battle between light and dark. This is the most down we've seen Sora since his journey with Donald and Goofy began, and it's clear that the stress of the mission and what Riku has been saying is getting to him. To go from a kid on a beach without a care in the world to the one who the king put all his trust in, in a matter of days, would be difficult on anyone. For the most part, he's kept up a good veneer, but the cracks are starting to show. Finally, we get to Hollow Bastion, the place where the story begins to converge. Sora immediately remarks that he feels like he knows the place and that there is a warmth inside of him. The song here, simply titled Hollow Bastion, is busy and melancholic. It does a great job of reflecting the depth of what's waiting within the walls. The combat theme, Scherzo di Notte, is probably my least favorite battle track though. I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's that I've heard it more than any other thanks to the level farming at Hollow Bastion. Hopping up, we run into Beast, who was just in an altercation with Riku. So, you finally made it. About time. I've been waiting for you. We've always been rivals, haven't we? You've always pushed me, as I've always pushed you. Riku! But it all ends here. There can't be two Keyblade Masters. What are you talking about? Let the Keyblade choose. It's true master! Maleficent was right. You don't have what it takes to save Kyrie. It's up to me. Only the Keyblade Master can open the secret door and change the world. But that's impossible. How did this happen? I'm the one who fought my way here with the Keyblade! You were just the delivery boy. Sorry, your part's over now. Here. Go play hero with this. Goofy, let's go. We have to remember our mission. Oh, well, I know the king told us to follow the key and all, but... And just like that, the Keyblade is gone, and with it, our friends. The Keyblade picks the one with the strongest heart, and Sora's heart right now is weak from stress and difficulty. Sora didn't receive the Keyblade until after Riku left through the Dark Portal at the beginning of the game, so it's entirely possible that the Keyblade's original chosen one was to be Riku, until he dove into the darkness. At the time, he wasn't strong enough to wield it. It's debatable that Sora was, but he was the next best pick, and so there it went. Now, Riku is finally strong enough. And the Keyblade makes no distinction for what a person would consider good or evil, or the inherent fight between light and darkness. Riku is the strongest, so the Keyblade returned to him. Donald and Goofy's connection to Sora was tenuous. They were only there for the Keyblade. They said so themselves not even ten minutes ago. The King told us to go out and find the Keybearer, and we found you, so as long as we stick together, It'll all work out okay. And now, Sora is left alone, without friends or a weapon to defend himself. Well, not entirely alone. Until we can get back the Keyblade, we are stuck with this wooden sword, and this is where most people will really feel that stat drop from not having a proper weapon equipped. Our attacks do nothing now. If it weren't for Beast being with us, we couldn't survive against these enemies. I love when games tie the story into the gameplay like this. We do the aforementioned puzzles in order to crack our way into the castle proper. It's a pretty dense maze with some weird ways to navigate and there's really no way to know where to go without just doing it. I imagine for those who don't know this map, it would take quite a long time to figure out the location of the goal. Once we get inside, we see Riku, Donald, and Goofy once again. Beast turns and leaves us as he sees a harrowing sight. The darkness may destroy my body, but it can't touch my heart. My heart will stay with my friends. It'll never die. Really? 
Well, we'll just see about that. Sora ain't gonna go anywhere. You'd betray your king? Not on your life. But I'm not gonna betray Sora either, cause he's become one of my best buddies after all we've been through together. See you later, Donald! Could you tell the king I'm really sorry? Hold on, Goofy! Well, you know, I'm the one and right for all. I guess you're stuck with us, Sora. Thanks a lot, Donald. Goofy. How will you fight without a weapon? I know now I don't need the Keyblade. I've got a better weapon. My heart! <laughs> Your heart? What good will that weak little thing do for you? Although my heart may be weak, it's not alone. It's grown with each new experience, and it's found a home with all the friends I've made. I've become part of their heart just as they've become a part of mine. And if they think of me now and then, if they don't forget me, then our hearts will be one. I don't need a weapon. My friends are my power. Yeah, all of that friends are my power stuff is nice and all, but having the Keyblade is pretty sweet too. Now we fight Riku once again. He's a pretty massive step up above his Destiny Islands fight. He moves fast and attacks quickly. It's not terribly bad though. Honestly, I feel that this is more like a breather boss to make you feel good about having the Keyblade back. He can definitely kill you, but with Donald and Goofy, he really doesn't stand much of a chance. After the fight, he bounces and we have to continue to find our way up the castle. We are greeted with a door that is missing four pieces that you have to find all throughout the area. Nested in this hide and seek puzzle is another hide and seek puzzle in a library where you have to find the books and put them in the right bookshelves in order to unlock more of the library. I like these puzzles because they are simple, but use all of the game's mechanics to hide things. The door puzzle is the only other time since Olympus where you are required to push something. We have to use numerous different spells to make some of them appear, and we have to use a trinity command to get both a book and a door piece. It's not deep by any means, but it's a great puzzle series for this game, and it breaks up the monotony of fighting constant battles. More worlds could have probably used something of this caliber to make them feel more interesting. We see a harrowing scene between Riku and a familiar cloaked figure with a dark voice. You can become stronger. You showed no fear in stepping through the door to darkness. It held no terror for you. Plunge deeper into the darkness, and your heart will grow even stronger. What should I do? It's really quite simple. Open yourself to the darkness, that is all. Let your heart, your being, become darkness itself. As we get closer, we hear a bit more about Maleficent's plans. Unlock it, and the Heartless will overrun this world. What do I care? The darkness holds no power over me. Rather, I will use its power to rule all worlds. She comes down from the apex to meet us. Maleficent's fight comes and goes, and we move into this mysterious portal that appears. Unlock? Yes, a Keyblade. But unlike yours, this Keyblade holds the power to unlock people's hearts. Allow me to demonstrate. Behold! Now we fight Maleficent Dragon. Unlike most enormous bosses like her, she attacks pretty relentlessly, mixing physical attacks with magic fire attacks regularly. The fire tends to scatter across the ground, making it difficult to attack her safely without taking constant tick damage. A couple strategies thoroughly break this boss. You can hop up onto her back and spam Strike Raid to your heart's content, or you can pop off Tinkerbell and Mash X to win. One of these two strategies is usually used since attacking her is normally not safe. So taking damage is an expected part of the fight unless you chill out on her back. Either way, she goes down and Maleficent is no more. We killed their leader, right? The party makes their way up to the apex of the castle and the keyhole housed within. We find Riku waiting for us, ready to explain what's going on. Kairi's heart has been hiding inside Sora the whole time. When she was blown away by the opening door at the islands, her heart was merged into his. That's why Sora had a reaction to Hollow Bastion sliding back at Deep Jungle. That's why he had this vision, although it was more like a memory. And that's why he felt warm when he finally got to Hollow Bastion. It was Kairi's heart within him, stirring in response to stimuli. 
And she is a princess of heart, the last piece needed to unlock the keyhole that will lead this man, the fabled Ansem, into everlasting darkness. It is I, Ansem, the seeker of darkness. So, I shall release you now, princess. Complete the keyhole with your power. Open the door. Lead me into everlasting darkness. In order to do it, Ansem has to use this fake keyblade of his own on Sora to release her heart from him. Sora! Unless Sora can win. As we get ready to fight, we hear the next unique boss track kick into high gear. Forza de Mal, or Forces of Evil. This is an incredibly ominous piece, busy and frantic, with oppressive organs and unyielding percussion. I said earlier that The Deep End is my favorite boss track in this game, but this one definitely gives it a run for its money, both in song quality and what it represents for the game. The following fight with Riku is extremely tough, at least by this game's standards up to this point. The only reason I'm so good at it now is that I had to fight it so many times as a kid to finally beat it. Riku attacks relentlessly fast, with moves that zip across wide swaths of the arena. He's powerful and can knock you off balance if you don't have a keyblade with decent recoil. He can power himself up as well, adding not only speed and power to his moves, but complexity with these projectiles he begins to shoot out. For the first time, perhaps in this entire game, it expects you to learn attacks, dodge or block them, and retaliate accordingly, and at an intense rate of repetition. He is also one of the first bosses to feature a desperation move that is hard to dodge and makes him completely invulnerable. And all of this has to be done without Donald and Goofy, which means no Tinkerbell to soften the fight. You can certainly strike rate spam if you wish, but where's the fun in that, yeah? It's basically the toughest required boss in the game, and deserves some praise for being fast, frantic, engaging, and challenging without being frustrating. Easily my vote for the best boss in Kingdom Hearts. After Riku is defeated, we take stock of our situation. Work. The keyhole's not finished yet! What can we do? Maybe we gotta go wake Kyrie up. I think you're right. If we can free your heart. But. But now. A keyblade that unlocks people's hearts. I wonder. Sora? Sora takes the keyblade that can release people's hearts and plunges it into his chest, freeing Kairi's heart as well as his own. Kairi's heart returns to her body, but Sora's goes off into the darkness. Suddenly, Ansem appears, but Riku fights back against him, giving Kairi and our palace time to escape. Then, one little shadow remains. Who could this be? We are in control of it and must pilot it back to Kairi. Is that you? Oh. This time I'll protect you. Beast shows up and buys us some time so we can escape and regroup. Sora and team with a revived Kairi in tow return to Traverse Town to talk to Leon and the Final Fantasy gang about what's going on. So back to Hollow Bastion to seal the big keyhole, but not before having a moment with Kairi. Important to note is that this good luck charm looks awfully like a palpu fruit. We also see from Riku, in a strange place, talking to a voice. It says, I'll be there soon. I have the other keyblade, the one that belongs to this world. The darkness in your heart kept you away from me. To close the door to darkness, we need two keys and two hearts. Maybe you being here was fate. We go back to Hollow Bastion and must fight our way to the top once again. We enter this large portal at the apex and on the other side, the behemoth greets us. This guy is simultaneously one of the worst bosses in the game and also one of the bosses you fight the most. 
He slowly ambles around the room, not attacking you directly. If you find yourself underneath one of his hooves when it stops down, you'll take damage, but this will pretty much never happen because you will spend most of the time on top of his back. His weak point is this horn on his head, and it's the only way to damage him, so you'll be up here the whole fight. Occasionally, he will slow down and begin to charge a big attack. If you can do enough damage to stun him before the attack goes off, you can stop it from happening. But if you don't, it's not a huge deal because the balls it summons just kind of fall to the ground and lightly track you. After the aforementioned stun phase, he will always use this, to my knowledge, unavoidable attack and then go back into his walking phase. That's the whole boss. Just wail on him. It's crazy to me that the very next boss after Riku is easily the worst the game has to offer, and maybe this shows that the team didn't fully understand the combat or what made it tick. Considering that Riku is a bit of an outlier in terms of quality of design, I'm guessing that's the case. Before we officially seal the keyhole, we have a chat with the Final Fantasy gang about what's going to happen going forward. When the keyholes are sealed, the worlds will go back to being separated again, so they will all be separated once again as well. We may never meet again, but we'll never forget each other. No matter where we are, our hearts will bring us together again. Besides, I couldn't forget you even if I wanted to. Without anything left to lose, we step in and close the final keyhole. On our way out, we talk to the princesses of heart who tell us that a darkness is growing somewhere far away. And with that, we go off to the final frontier, the end of the world. The end of the world is a mishmashed collection of worlds that were destroyed by the heartless. It is a gauntlet of non-stop battles against the toughest enemies the game can toss at you. The music that plays here, simply called End of the World, is a different version of the track from Dive to the Heart, making this a bookend situation, something I'm a sucker for. Fragments of Sorrow, the combat track for this world, is very similar to the more bombastic section of Dive to the Heart that plays during the Dark Side fight. Very little story progress takes place here until nearly the end, so let's take this moment to talk about Ansem. Ansem is the instigator of this whole story. Early on in the game, we learned that Ansem studied the Heartless and wrote his findings down in a collection of reports which had been scattered to all different worlds. And yet, the person who overtakes Riku, who we see at the beginning of the game in the cloak, he calls himself Ansem as well. Is this the same person? The answer lies within these reports. After defeating many of the game's bosses, you will earn an Ansem report in non-sequential order. First you earn the odds, and then the evens later. Piecing these reports together is a part of learning who this man is and what drove him to such a lust for darkness. The reports tell a story of a man, full of inquisitiveness. He inhabits a world which he protects with his knowledge, and the people of this world are thankful for him. But he aches to know there are things he does not understand. He decides to undergo a series of tests, the subject of which being the darkness that he believes sits dormant within every heart, always threatening to boil up and overtake them. He tries to extract the darkness, cultivate it, suppress it, amplify it, but the tests only result in the collapse of the test subject's heart. Eventually he finds creatures born of darkness in the basement underneath the castle. The true nature of these creatures eludes him for a time, but he does deduce that they are entirely devoid of emotion. The shadows multiply underground. Ansem decides to call them heartless, not because they lack a heart, but because they are completely devoid of care and emotion, purely instinctual. He goes on to perform tests giving the Heartless access to samples, sacrificing people in order to further his knowledge on the Heartless. They kill anyone that enters their vicinity and absorb their hearts, their prey vanishing without a trace. Later, while studying one particular Heartless's behavior, Ansem stumbles upon a door that he opened, leading to a large mass of energy. That night, a meteor shower occurs leaving behind elastic material. Ansem hypothesizes that the energy mass behind the door is the heart of the world, and the Heartless want to take it as well as those belonging to living beings. Ansem decides next to build a machine that can create artificial Heartless, showing nearly identical traits to the real ones. He marks them with an emblem to show the difference. Then, a king from another world shows up, explaining that pathways between the worlds were opened up when Ansem opened that door. The king tells Ansem of the gummy blocks and the keyblade. One legend says its wielder saved the world, while another says that he wrought chaos and ruin upon it. Ansem believes that the Keyblade is somehow related to the door he opened. Finally, he comes to one last conclusion. Just as people have hearts, so do worlds. The same can be said of stars in the night sky, and deep within each world lies a door to its heart. The heartless desire those hearts. Born out of darkness in people's hearts, they seek to return to a greater heart. Yes, that's it. The heartless come from people's hearts, as does the darkness. Is the core of the world's heart the world of the heartless? I will pursue the answers there and become all-knowing. My path is set. 
I shall seek out the wielder of the Keyblade and the princesses. My body is too frail for such a journey, but I must do this. I will cast it off and plunge it into the depths of darkness. Ansem had an insatiable desire for knowledge and progress, so much so that it drove him to do horrible things. He sacrificed living human beings in his experiment on the Heartless and wrote about it with cold cynicism like it did nothing to him. This man created more Heartless, artificial ones, so he could continue his research forever, while at the same time bringing complete ruin upon the worlds and the people dwelling within. And in the end, he plunged himself so far into darkness that he became darkness himself, a Heartless of great power. Sometime later, he continues to write. In his 11th report, he decides to safeguard the possibility that the Keyblade could come to his world and ruin his plan. He sends out a girl who he believes to be pure of heart, like the six known princesses of heart, and believes that she will lead him to the key. In the meantime, Ansem begins to postulate on the other side, the realm of darkness, which resides somewhere beyond the doors of Kingdom Hearts. He longs to get to the realm of darkness and believes Kingdom Hearts is the key. In his final report, Ansem theorizes that when someone loses their hearts to the heartless, their body only disappears in this world. In another realm, their body continues to be, although it does not truly exist. This he dubs with the term nobody, and thus the report of Ansem comes to an end. I think Ansem is an excellent villain. He's simple enough that kids playing this game can understand it, but with the addition of the Ansem reports, there is enough depth to his character to give some real intrigue. I love that the game drip feeds you these reports across the entirety of the game, and most of them remain unavailable to you until very close to the end, ramping up the tension as you approach the ultimate climax. The last three I talked about were added in the Final Mix re-release and are locked behind the game's most gruelingly difficult in-game bosses which is a great way to incentivize people to engage with the combat. Or at least strike rate spam, anyway. Ansem is a great picture of one of the themes of this game. Unchecked ambition, which can drive one to do terrible things. I'll talk about that more in a bit. For now, let's finish this game, shall we? Moving through the end of the world, we eventually come to Chernabog. You know, the one from Fantasia? His boss fight functions almost exactly the same as Giant Ursula, except you don't have Dolphin Kick to more easily get away from his AoE blasts, making it... harder? I think? I don't know. This boss is a pushover, assuming you have the stats to get through it. I mean, bosses like this basically can't be incredibly deep because they take away almost all of your defensive abilities. On the contrary, certain tactics like spamming Strike Raid won't work here, so they do have their merits, perhaps. It is possible to land on his shoulders though, so I guess you could strike rate spam if you like really felt like it. That being said, I feel like these bosses that change your ability so drastically are a little poorly thought out. They never give way to any interesting challenge, something we will soon see more of when we talk about the super bosses. Cool to note is the song that plays here is Night on Bald Mountain, from his Fantasia short. After Chernabog, we descend deeper into this place, fighting our way through yet another behemoth and then a huge onslaught of Heartless, until we move through here and into a room with a familiar looking door. This is the point of no return, a concept that has been lost to time in many ways, for better or worse. In case you don't know, when this game is over, the final boss is defeated, you are spat back to the last save rather than the game continuing in light of what you accomplished. There are upsides and downsides to this approach. It kind of sucks that we don't get to see the worlds or characters after the events of the game takes place, to see how stuff begins to recover and function when the Heartless threat is over. On the other hand, the writers would have to come up with some hand-wavy excuse to explain why the Heartless are still roaming around and we can still travel between worlds if the threat was taken care of. Control ran into this problem in my opinion. By not writing a firm, impassable ending, it set itself up to feel less engaging. Almost like none of the actions you took throughout the game actually had purpose because if they had, there wouldn't be enemies to fight after the game was over. Kingdom Hearts chose to make its story the most important thing in the final hours, and given the story as we understand it up until this point, a canon post-game sequence wouldn't make any sense. Let's open that door. On the other side we see Sora's Island. After going to the secret place, we hear the voice of Ansem recount the lines he first said to us. You see, darkness is the heart's true essence. That's not true! The heart may be weak, and sometimes it may even give in. But I've learned that deep down there's a light that never goes out. So you have come.
come this far, and still you understand nothing. Every light must fade. Every heart return to darkness. With that, Ansem finally comes to us directly. The first boss in the multi-phase final battle is a bit of a doozy, I'll be honest. He doesn't have a ton of attacks, but what he does do can really mess you up. In particular, occasionally he will yell Submit! and his guardian will reach out for you. Whoever he hits will become possessed by the guardian, occasionally messing up your action commands. Ansem will move around using his bubble attack, trying to catch you when the Heartless grabs you. This is pretty horrible because it can be tough to recover from if you aren't careful. Submit does a ton of damage and so does Ansem's bubble, on top of the fact that you can't really attack him without getting grabbed by the Guardian. This is the worst trick up his sleeve. Other than that, he has a few basic attacks, a defensive guard, and a projectile attack that can be blocked and returned to him. It's pretty simple but pretty difficult, especially if you get hit by Submit. Once this fight is over, Destiny Island begins to split up, and we go into the center, Donald and Goofy getting left behind. Next we fight... another dark side? Really? I legitimately don't understand why this fight is here. It's almost the exact same as the last few times we've done it, and it adds basically nothing to this battle. Anyway, after that we fight Ansem again, except this time we're alone and he's got a slightly different moveset. Submit makes a return, though he seems to use it less. Most notably, he will occasionally start zipping around the arena, and you have to block him to open him up again. He also now comes with a desperation move that shows up around halfway through the battle. It's not difficult to dodge in the slightest, and really only serves to waste your time. I can't remember ever getting hit by this attack, so that's great. His second fight is honestly easier than the first, just because he uses submit far less often. After this, we are taken to a different place, where in the distance we can see this enormous door, Kingdom Hearts. Look as hard as you are able. You'll not find even the smallest glimmer of light. From those dark depths are all hearts born. Even yours. <gasps> Darkness conquers all worlds! Ansem then integrates with this large ship thing called the World of Chaos, and we enter into the second phase of this war, with multiple stages taking place across this thing. First up is a solo fight with Ansem. We're flying around, which means you know what I'm about to say because I said it for Giant Ursula and Chernabog, these bosses aren't interesting and have a depth threshold that they really can't go over. This one is no exception. He attacks with his staff periodically, sends these little bat heartless at you, and tries to hit you with his laser beams. Just tanking his hits and wailing on him is the only strategy if you don't want this fight to take an hour. We are now whisked to different parts of the world of chaos. First we fight a bunch of shadows, then these little pea shooter things, then we fight some dark balls to rescue Goofy. Now we fight the face figurehead, then onto an invisible onslaught to rescue Donald. Finally, with the whole team back together, we take down Ansem one last time. He only adds one new attack to this phase where he tries to suck you into this big ball. I don't know what happens if he does, but I can't imagine it's good. This final gauntlet is pretty epic, but doesn't lend itself to being a great cap off to the gameplay itself. It's disappointing to me that most of it's spent in flying mode because it's just not as mechanically interesting as when you're on the ground. It's just kind of a shame. When the battle ends, Ansem makes one final plea, that Kingdom Hearts would fill him with the power of darkness. Unfortunately for him, he's come to the wrong conclusions. You're wrong. I know now, without a doubt, Kingdom Hearts is light. The light consumes Ansem, and our heroes go to shut the door once again. But one thing Ansem said was correct. It takes two keys to close the door. Suddenly, Riku appears to help us close the door. But Heartless are appearing all over the place to try and consume this heart. Majesty! Now, Sora, let's close this door for good! Don't But... Don't worry! There will always be a door to the light. Sora, you can trust King Mickey. Now, they're coming. Donald, Goofy, thank you. King Mickey and Sora both lock the door to Kingdom Hearts, trapping Riku and Mickey inside. The worlds become disconnected and restored. Kyrie is returned to Destiny Islands and the credits sequence begins. The end. During this closing scene, we hear the original, unremixed version of Simple and Clean. This is a great song, soft and supple and befitting a mostly happy ending such as this. Being that it has lyrics and was written for this game as the theme song of sorts, it stands to reason that the lyrics should match the game in some way, right? 
Many people don't think so, but I actually do. The lyrics are about two people in a relationship, probably a romantic one. They seem to be young because of lines like this. And it's about confusion and not understanding the future or even the present. Yet, in the end, all that matters is that they hold each other, and as long as they can do that, the future isn't so scary. The most obvious analogy for this song is Sora and Kairi, and it's about feelings they have rather than actual events between them. The lines about the future not being scary in each other's arms, about things being simple and elegant between them in spite of the hustle and bustle of life around them, I think this is what Kairi wishes could be happening between her and Sora. Sora even specifically asks about Kairi's family, to which she replies in-game that she doesn't remember. Some things aren't that simple. This is a song from Kairi's perspective to Sora, about how she wishes things could be between them. Fitting that it should play over Kairi's final scene as she explores the Destiny Islands one last time on screen. After the credits, we are treated to a scene of Sora, Donald, and Goofy chasing after Pluto, who has showed up sometime later with another letter from the King, a cliffhanger for adventures yet to come, although I highly suspect this was not hinting at anything specific. At this point, I'm pretty sure that this was intended as one of those cliffhangers that can be used to either tie into the next game, or simply imply that our trio continues to adventure together in stories untold. Obviously, there are things left hanging, like the fate of Riku and Mickey, but this can also function well enough as a final scene. Either way, we are greeted with a battle record, detailing some stats about our adventure. And back to the title screen we are sent, with Dearly Beloved greeting us once again. I have more I want to say about the story, but for now, there's actually a pretty hefty endgame that you can undertake if you feel like it, and I'm of the opinion that this endgame content is... yeah, it's content. When you start the game, you are given two difficulty options, normal and expert. The only difference between them is that, on expert mode, the enemies deal double damage. Simple enough. Except it actually isn't quite that simple, because this is how I'm choosing to introduce us to the changes made in Kingdom Hearts Final Mix. I'm playing this game on the 1.5 Remix Collection, which is the Final Mix version of the game that was originally released only in Japan nine months after the original version came out, and had a ton of balance and story-related changes. In this version, there are three difficulties. Final Mix Beginner has the player dealing triple damage and starting with a bunch of really useful items that make the game 100% trivial. On top of that, the secret endings, which I will bring up soon, are not accessible. This would be the option to pick if you only care about the story or this is your first game because it effectively nukes all the challenge. The difficulty called Final Mix has you dealing what's called normal damage. For many, it's still going to be too easy, but this is probably a good option if you aren't used to action games. Finally, there's Final Mix Proud, which doubles enemy damage and makes the gummy ship missions more difficult. This is the one I played on, and honestly, it's still a little on the easy side at times, as we discussed earlier. That, however, is probably a good place to transition into some of the other changes Final Mix made. On top of a huge list of balance changes made to enemies and our party's abilities, a big list of new abilities were added, all of which I've already been over. But the one I wanted to highlight here is Leaf Bracer. This game was not designed with Leaf Bracer in mind, because it didn't exist when the game originally came out. It makes you invincible while casting Cure, which when combined with Second Chance guaranteeing you can't die from one single big attack, means that there's basically no reason why you should ever die. Bosses don't attack quickly enough to punish you if you hit 1 HP before you can throw out a quick cure, and so it makes most bosses incredibly trivial. It almost feels like they should have increased Cure's MP cost to 2 to combat the overpowered nature of Leaf Bracer, as that would make it significantly more difficult to cure spam your way through bosses. It's a questionable decision, to be sure, but before long I'll actually be advocating for its existence, so just sit tight. A lot of the abilities that add some much-needed flow and snappiness to the combat come as a part of the final mix version, notably Slapshot and Sliding Dash. Tons of accessories were added, including some EXP-boosting charms that make the in-game level grind significantly more bearable. New weapons were included as rewards for beating some of the in-game super bosses, and basically all Heartless were given cool-looking palette swaps. The cutscenes where we see Riku in a few different situations during the game were added in this version as well, and the Ansem reports 11-13 through 13 were added to tie the story in with what's coming up, as they had a better idea of the story going forward by this point, if you ask me anyway. Again, I've got more to say about this story, but let's talk about synthesis for now. On top of the synthesis recipes already present in the base game, Final Mix added a slew of new ones and retooled some of the recipes themselves. They added a bunch of new Heartless that drop a bunch of new ingredients, and these are pretty cool. They all present themselves as palette-swapped Heartless with new mechanics. Some of them are just straight fights, and some of them are more like puzzles. 
For the pink agaricus, you have to find the three white mushrooms and cast stop on them, then cast stop on the big guy and hit him as many times as possible. Getting over 40 hits on an attempt will give you a chance at its rare drop. The grand ghost appears in Monstro's stomach and can only be hurt by giving him healing items. The jet balloon flies around Hook's ship and launches Torpedo Heartless at you. The Giga shadows despawn if they touch you, meaning you won't have a chance to grab their items. I like all of these Heartless, in concept. There are a few problems though. First, there's the problem of the spawn rates. These guys are not guaranteed to spawn in the rooms they appear in. That's not really a problem, just exit and enter the room until they pop. Fine, good even. The problem is that, after you first find them and interact with them, they won't even have a chance to respawn until you've moved at least two rooms away. This is especially annoying for the Neo Shadows which show up in the room right before the final rest, which has a save point in it. If you think returning to the world map would reset the spawn RNG, you'd be wrong. You can do that as many times as you like, but they will still not respawn until you've moved two rooms away. It's possible that saving and going back to the title screen resets the RNG as well, but who wants to keep doing that? I don't exactly understand why their spawn rates have to be so cryptic. You almost certainly won't be farming these guys until after the main game is over, so why does there still need to be a chance to spawn the normal enemies? They really should spawn every time you enter their rooms, because why not? It wouldn't make farming them too easy by any means, because, and this is my second problem, even when you do find them, there's no guarantee you're gonna get the item you want. Each one obviously has a gimmick or criteria you must meet before you get a chance of grabbing their items, and sometimes they just won't drop. You need at least six of each of these items before you can craft all of the synthesis items, so it'll take at least six goes at these enemies before you can move on, oftentimes much more if you're unlucky. All of that on top of making them spawn sporadically seems like overkill to me. The endgame synth grind would have been beefy enough as it is, even if they had guaranteed spawning. On the positive side, Final Mix added some accessories that boost the EXP rates, as I mentioned earlier, and this makes the grind to level 100 much easier. I definitely remember it taking much longer on the original release, and even longer if you picked daytime at the opening. Going from level 1 to level 100 feels like almost a different game. This is going to depend on what abilities you equip, but Sora is much more fluid and mobile, has a number of new moves at his disposal, and his magic is exceptionally more powerful. That being said, many of these abilities that improve the flow of combat were added in the final mix version, so that's something to be aware of. But why bother hitting level 100 anyway? There's some pretty solid in-game content that expects you to be a decent bit higher level than when you can finish the game. There's the Hades Cup, which is at Olympus Coliseum, something that I haven't really talked about yet. Basically, it's an arena combat mode disguised as a tournament or game in which you fight heartless and occasionally other people as you compete to become a true hero. The first three cups, Phil, Pegasus, and Hercules, each drop at random points throughout the game and are meant to be taken on sometime around when they unlock. They are 10 rounds long and in them you fight Leon and Yuffie at the same time and Hercules to cap off Pegasus and Hercules respectively. Once you complete them regularly, you can take them on alone without your party members and then once you've done that, you can try and finish them within a 3 minute time limit. There are actual in-game rewards for this as well. Sometimes it's useful ability, sometimes it's a really rare synthesis material. Maybe it's just me, but I'm a sucker for tournament fights and games like this, so I think this is a great addition. It doesn't do much to convince you that the combat is any better than it is, but if you enjoy the combat for what it is, you'll enjoy this. Near the end of the game, you unlock the Hades Cup, an enormous 50 round tournament with multiple bosses. First is Solo Yuffie, then the Behemoth, again? Why? Then a rematch with Cerberus, Cloud and Leon at the same time, then a boss fight with Hades. He's got a few annoying tricks up his sleeve and some difficult attacks to dodge, but he's not too bad even if you fight him at a somewhat low level like I seem to have. When his head glows red, he becomes more powerful and more difficult to find openings, but hitting his fireballs back at him will always give you one. He goes down after a while, and the final boss of the Hades Cup is the Rock Titan, who is an absolute pushover for some reason. He barely attacks, and you can always see them coming from a mile away. Every time you hit him, you get a tech point though, so maybe this was meant to be sort of like a big triumphant finale, where you trounce a huge Titan without much effort. On top of the Hades Cup, which I would consider in-game content, we also have the super bosses. There are five of these guys, and each one is more complicated and more difficult than basically any boss in the main game. Well, except one. Let's start with the easiest and work up from there. Phantom is a nothing boss. I almost wonder if he was planned to be a regular boss, but got shafted to secret boss territory at some point. Talking to Tinkerbell with Peter Pan and your party will give you the option to go to the otherwise locked-off clock tower where the Phantom is flying around wreaking havoc or whatever. 
His main gimmick is that you can't attack him normally. The heart under his cloak will appear after a certain amount of time in one of four randomly chosen flavors, vanilla, lemon, blueberry, and cherry. These determine how you must hit him. It's physical, lightning, blizzard, and fire, respectively. He has exactly three attacks, and one of them barely counts. He swipes at you with his claw periodically. This is the one he uses most. After an attack phase, he will often fly to the clock tower and summon this little ball that does a ton of damage to you, but you can avoid it completely and easily by hiding on the other side of the clock tower and waiting till the ball disappears by hitting the wall. The last attack he uses is Doom, which if you know anything about Final Fantasy, you probably already know how this works. It's a move that sets a timer above a teammate's head, and after that timer runs out, the teammate irrevocably dies. He seems to always target Peter Pan first, then your other party member, then you. In order to stop the clock, you have to, well, literally stop the clock. Casting stop on the clock face will cause the timer to freeze for a certain amount of time. You can wait until you see it counting down again, or you can just hit it every time the phantom flies to the clock face, guaranteeing you won't have to worry about anyone dying from doom. By nature of the fact that you can't attack him directly and you have no way to recover MP beyond items and getting hit by the Phantom if you have MP Rage equipped, the difficulty here doesn't come in whether you can outdamage him, it's whether you have enough MP to finish it. Having a large MP pool is a must because you're mostly dealing damage with magic, and having a pocket full of elixirs really helps. If you run out of MP restoring avenues before the battle is over, you basically just have to die and try again. I don't know why I was afraid to fight this guy as a kid. I think I didn't fully understand the gimmick, and maybe he legitimately scared me because his design is a little bit creepy, but he's an absolute pushover. Let's move on up the rung to Ice Titan. The next two I talk about are really kind of on the same general level of difficulty, so your mileage may vary here. The big boy here shows up in the gold match at Olympus Coliseum, and again, can't be attacked directly for most of the fight. Instead, you have to parry these ice shards that he spawns back into his head. Eventually, he will stun and you can wail on him a bit. The difficulty here comes in all the other attacks he weaves in between the ice shard volleys. At first, all he can really do is bring up ice spikes from the ground, the pattern of which is somewhat difficult to predict or dodge. He starts spawning these ice balls over your head a little ways into the battle, adding another element to be aware of. As the battle goes on, he will start throwing these in during other attacks as sort of a shakeup to how the fight flows in between attacks. Eventually, he will use an Ice Breath attack that can freeze you, dealing damage and opening you up to future attacks. You can also slip on the ice, kind of humorous, honestly. The last attack he adds, beyond just increasing the randomness of the Ice Shard volleys and the density of attacks, is this Ice Blast that freezes you multiple times and does quite a bit of damage. Having to juggle dodging and returning the Ice Shards is engaging and pretty tough. Watching for telegraphs for new attacks in between volleys has a frantic chaotic energy that keeps you on your toes. Even with Leaf Bracer, he attacks fast enough that he can catch you in between heals or drain your MP very quickly. I fought him before I had unlocked MP Rage though, so this one's up in the air. Even the timing for some of these volleys so you don't get hit at the tail end can be really tough. I think this is a solid boss with an interesting gimmick. It's good. Next up is Kurt Zisa. Find him by talking to the flying carpet in Aladdin's room. You'll fly out to a unique arena in the desert where this big guy will pop out and attack you. He's another boss with a sort of gimmick. This time around, he will lock you from doing certain actions during different parts of the fight. If he's holding these orbs, he locks away your magic, meaning the only way to restore HP is with items. He throws a few basic, wide-reaching attacks at you during this time, and you have to break each of the orbs in his hands. Upon doing so, he falls to the ground and opens up for attacking his main health bar. After a while, he gets back up and switches things around. Now a barrier will appear around him, and the only way to damage it is with magic. Attacking him does drop these MP orbs, which is nice. Again, he tosses some basic attacks at you, but this phase is generally less dangerous since you have your magic available. Break the barrier, and again, you will go back on the offensive until he decides to get back up. That's about it. He just keeps cycling between these two phases until he dies. He adds one big attack, though, where he spins around rapidly and flies at you multiple times. It's tough to dodge and deals a ton of damage, making it the primary way he tries to kill you. This guy is pretty good, but I don't find him as engaging as Ice Titan. Next up is probably the most infamous boss in this game, Sephiroth. He appears in the Platinum match at the Colosseum and is easily the hardest boss in the original release. Just watch some of this footage. His attacks come ridiculously fast, and this fire pillar attack is... Ooh, it's a doozy. I'm level 100 in this footage, and you can see how much damage it does. The sword attacks are honestly more annoying than anything, although I do have a serious problem with them. There are two different versions of his basic sword attack. The second one that I don't mind is where he jumps forward before swinging, the jump acting as a sort of telegraph in a way. The first, which he tends to use somewhat more often, is this one, where he just tosses out the sword swing with only 10 frames of lead up. 
This is incredibly fast as a telegraph for an attack, on top of the fact that the animation leading into the attack is so small that I can't even call it much of a telegraph. What's worse is if you like to use guard like I do because counterattacks make for good openers and combos, you have to predict this attack coming because you can't possibly see the telegraph and hit guard in time because of the lead in that the guard has. He is basically guaranteed to catch you. In all of these clips where I'm successfully guarding against the attack, I'm hitting guard around four frames or so before the telegraph even begins basically meaning I'm getting lucky with the timing because he doesn't have any rhyme or reason to how often he uses these sword swipes. Generally, it's easier to use dodge roll against this attack, but the timing is still so tight that you have to predict it coming. You can't really wait to see what he's going to do. I think that's kind of dumb, but it's not egregious by any means. The sword swipes only deal about a fourth of your HP, at least at my defense stat, which has diminishing returns as it grows. The really bad attack is this fire pillar. Sephiroth can choose to throw this attack into the mix at almost any time, and often as a retaliation against a combo. If you are caught next to him when he uses it, you will take two hits unless you use Cure with Leaf Bracer or throw off a Strike Raid. It's possible to dodge roll out if you do it at a very specific time and in a very specific angle, but it's so difficult to accomplish it's almost not even worth mentioning. In fact, in my first attempt, even with Leaf Bracer, this is the attack that killed me because he used it twice in a row, whereas he typically goes into another sword phase. Attacking him after he throws out a sword swipe usually opens him up to a combo, unless he's already chosen to follow up his sword swipe with a fire pillar, in which he has super armor and can't be knocked over. Say goodbye to your HP. This attack is, frankly, stupid. Without spamming Strike Raid or using Leaf Bracer, the latter of which didn't even exist when the boss was designed, he is simply unfair unless you pull really good RNG and he decides not to use the Fire Pillar that much. This is enough for me to have advocate using Leaf Bracer on this boss as being a completely fair thing to do. If he's gonna be cheap like this, at least throw Sora a bone and give him a cheap ability too. Because this attack leaps over the line of challenging but fair into unfair territory, especially without Leaf Bracer. That's not where the problems with Sephiroth stop though. He always auto-retaliates after 4 hits, but the move he chooses to retaliate with is completely random, meaning it could be as innocuous as teleporting away from you and coming in for a slash, or as devastating as hitting you point blank with a fire pillar. If you don't trigger the retaliation at some point within 6 hits though, he will break out after one attack and hit you with whatever the heck he wants. I find the 4 attack retaliation weird because this game shipped with multiple combo plus abilities, meaning you are inherently punished for using them in this fight and it was designed in that way. Phase 2 and 3 aren't as bad in my opinion. He adds some sporadic orb attacks and a new slash move, a desperation move called Octo Slash that is tough to dodge but not impossible. If your Keyblade has high recoil, you can just spam attacks to get through it. His Meteor move is pretty easy to dodge and isn't very deadly either way. Oh, and he has a move called Heartless Angel, where he waves his hand in the air and calls down an angel to sap all your HP and MP instantly, killing you if you don't have second chance equipped. This sounds really bad, but it's so easy to knock him out of it that I actually don't have footage of it happening, so it's not really worth worrying about. I seriously think this guy is poorly designed, as much as he is kind of fun to fight in spite of that just because of how frantic he is. I wouldn't feel that way if he hit any harder or I didn't have Leaf Bracer, obviously. Randomness is a part of combat in games like this, but being that he can randomly decide to kill you with almost no warning, it's not well done randomness, it's bad design. I think one of the best ways to show how bad this is is through the words of Bizkit047 in his Sephiroth level 1 guide. Yes, he fights him at level 1. I'm gonna get to that. Bizkit is among some of the best Kingdom Hearts speedrunners that has ever played the game. His runs are still very high on the leaderboards in spite of the fact that he hasn't run the games much recently. On top of that, he is gracious enough to post a bunch of tutorials and guides on his YouTube channel, which I will be pulling from and mentioning more than a few times throughout this series. In this level 1 guide for Sephiroth, he says a lot of interesting things. If you do that, he will always counter, just the same as original KH1. However, what he does now is random, and I can either get lucky and dodge it or get hit. And then I try to get lucky dodging whatever he retaliates with. You can punish him on that too sometimes, but it's not consistent. Also, I only do the auto counter if I'm at full HP on level 1 or else I'll die randomly to like Fire Pillar. Like there he just instant slash teleported. I could not predict that and I had to take the hit. I am of the opinion that these things are signs that this boss is poorly designed outright. Some randomness is okay, but randomness that can get you killed with no recourse on your part is kind of stupid. He has to play very cautiously and manipulate the AI in order to limit potential unfair deaths. But even he says, 
that he gets lucky numerous times or that there are certain situations where he could have just died outright had it gone differently because of what Sephiroth chooses to do. Not giving the player recourse is what I take offense to, and you shouldn't be forced to abuse invincibility frames from things like Strike Raid or Leaf Bracer to get through it. Clearly you don't have to, Bizkit shows us that much in this video, but the fact of the matter is that even he doesn't have 100% confidence that Sephiroth won't just do something weird and kill him while he's trying to do this tutorial. Now I'm not quite done talking about Sephiroth just yet. I've got a section devoted to my level 1 playthrough later, but for now I want to discuss my experiences with Sephiroth at level 1, and what it shows about the boss's design choices. At level 1 you can take 3 hits total from Sephi before he kills you. Given how quickly and aggressively he attacks, this is obviously extremely difficult. Now, full disclosure, neither Sefi nor any boss in this game is designed to be fought at level 1, much less at 3 hit points. That doesn't mean that we can't find faults in the design of bosses by making every single hit count. So that's what I did. And what did I find? Did my findings support my idea that this boss is actually really poorly designed? Here's two clips, synced up to Sefi's frame data. In these clips, I will hit him on exactly the same frame, 37 frames after the blue sword blur appears on his sword. Guess which one will cause him to stagger. Here's two clips. This time I'm going to hit him at either 34 or 44 frames. Take a guess as to which one will result in a stagger. Here are 6 clips. In each one, I will hit Sefi 36 frames after his sword blur appears. If you haven't already caught on, some of them will end in a stagger, and others will not. This is not because of his 7 hit auto retaliation. Many of these happen when I've just recently triggered his 4 hit retaliation. I actually went through and checked every single one of these and found that only a couple happen because of auto retaliation due to me not counting hits properly. Here's 6 more clips, this time I'm going to hit him after 39 frames. Right, you get the drill. My purpose in showing this footage is to show this boss's inconsistency. I'm assuming that the deciding factor in whether a hit after a sword swipe will end in a stagger or not is whether he decided to attack at some point before my attack connects. But this is a huge problem. The boss can randomly decide whether your attack works or not based entirely on factors out of your control. Important to note here is the fact that Sephiroth was different in the vanilla version of the game prior to Final Mix. His auto retaliation always resulted in him warping away and using a sword slash rather than just doing whatever he feels like. While this wouldn't fix the problem of him randomly deciding not to stagger, this would make reacting to his retaliation much more consistent. The problem here, and the reason why they changed it, is because it's fairly easy to loop him in the original version of the fight. While that is a problem, I would take that over him randomly smacking you any day of the week. It's not as bad of a problem when you've got more HP, but that doesn't mean that it's okay to design a boss in an unfair way, and that definitely doesn't excuse inconsistent staggering. I also have some footage of some incredibly janky hitboxes on Sefi's leaping slash, which basically means I just don't attack him after that strike. All of this on top of the problems that show themselves even before fighting at level 1, because they are certainly still active as well. So I think this boss is kind of awful in a lot of ways. When you have some buffer room to not die super quickly to cheap attacks and inconsistent staggering, he's fine. Even fun, but that doesn't equate to being well designed. And before you ask, no, I never beat him at level 1. I just don't have the patience for this kind of stuff anymore. Now that certainly doesn't mean that I don't like challenge in my games. It was not that long ago that my wife and I played through and beat Cuphead, an absolutely grueling experience at times, but incredibly fun and quantifiably fair. Just earlier this year, in preparation for the Hollow Knight video I made, I finally convinced myself to grind out Pantheon 5, one of the most difficult gaming challenges I have personally undertook if we look at the sheer amount of hours and practice it required. So not only am I not a stranger to challenge in video games, I embrace it. But it has to be fair. If I die, it has to be entirely my fault. Otherwise, there is very little chance I will feel inspired to continue to undertake it. I hate feeling frustrated while I'm playing games, and there's no quicker way to frustrate me when I'm playing a game than to kill me in ways that are inconsistent or out of my control. And that's exactly what Sephiroth does, so I decided not to bother. It's, again, not like the boss was designed with level 1 in mind, so I don't exactly feel bad for not pushing through. I would argue that it's Kingdom Hearts gameplay at its worst. Alright, we've got one more super boss to discuss, Unknown, who was added in Final Mix. This guy is a black cloaked figure that appears in the room you fought Maleficent Dragon, and he heavily ties into the story going forward from this point. 
This guy just barely overtakes Sephiroth in terms of difficulty, but I'm of the opinion that it's much more fair and not as reliant on iframe spam. He is the only boss in the game designed with Leaf Bracer in mind, and that fact plays out in a couple different ways. He attacks very quickly with these lightsaber-esque blades, but that's not really enough to punch through the invincibility you get when you are hit on the ground in this game. Each attack phase comes quickly, however, so you have to stay on top of him. Sometimes he throws out a defensive shield, sometimes he launches these orbs at you. Either way, you are never put into a situation where one random move could put you down. He's a bit slower than Sephiroth, but the difference is that his moves have a rhythm to them that can be predicted, making him much more bearable. The thing that makes him tough is a move called Invitation to Nothingness, which locks you in this sort of trap that removes all your commands, replacing them with shock and occasionally release. This is a unique and interesting use of the command menu system. You have to find and hit release or you'll keep taking tick damage until you die or the spell wears off eventually. You'll take even more damage if you hit shock on accident, which is bound to happen because release moves so quickly. Plus, Unknown stays active and aggressive during this move, making matters even worse. This is incredibly tough, but I wouldn't call it unfair. There are ways to avoid getting hit by this attack, and I get out of it more times than not. That being said, it's also the only move that kills me in this fight. In fact, the time I did beat him this time around, I was using Tinkerbell, and she revived me from this move before almost immediately getting hit with it two more times, which I managed to break out of. He adds a few more things as the battle goes on. Nothing that's too crazy. Laser bullets that have a staggered timing to them, a more complicated multi-hit lightsaber attack, and a desperation move where he shoots out a bunch of lasers and chases you around the room. I will say that, in Sephiroth's defense, this guy also breaks out of your combos after 4 hits, making the use of combo pluses utterly pointless and quite detrimental. I don't really understand why they are designed this way when the game has these combo increasing abilities in it. It's sort of silly. Now the fact I still have stun impact equipped during these fights is completely on me. <laughs> Overall, I'd say Unknown is a better fight than Sephiroth simply because he's much more predictable and his moves don't come at you at lightning speed. In spite of the fact that I died more to Unknown as I was recording this footage, it felt more fair to me, and like the deaths were entirely my fault, or the one death that did occur when fighting Sephiroth felt cheaper by comparison. Yeah, so I did a level 1 playthrough of this game. The ability that allows you to do that, 0 EXP, wasn't included until the KH 1.5 Remix release on PS3 and basically every console since then. To quickly run down the changes in this version, 0 EXP and Combo Master were added. Triangle is now used for certain actions like opening chests or interacting with things. The summons are now in Command 4, which is where the interaction commands used to be. And the camera controls were improved, among other things. The addition of 0 EXP, something that was first included in KH2 FM, was a bizarre choice because the game is not even remotely designed around its use, as I've already spoken of. The game is too stats focused for this to really work properly. For that reason, most of my boss discussion remains unchanged, even after experiencing them in this way, because it's almost like you're playing a different game entirely. That being said, I do want to bring up some things. Lock, Shock, and Barrel got a footnote in my boss discussion, but here, no, 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 they deserve their own paragraph. These guys suck when you can only take two hits. Firstly, they are so small that their telegraphs are almost completely non-existent. That is especially annoying for Locke, who throws these incredibly teeny tiny pebbles at you that somehow kill you anyway. These can hit you from anywhere in the room and, while easily avoidable, can often snipe you while you're recovering from Shock or Barrel's attacks. These bosses take a good amount of time because your damage output is so low. And the longer you're in these fights, the more likely you are to be put into situations where the attacks layer over each other in a way that is unfair. You see, the big reason why I'm so harsh on these bosses this time around is because this game was designed for you to have a lot of potential hits before needing to heal. You don't notice cheap hits nearly as often when they don't result in a death, but you do notice when a cheap hit ends in restarting the fight, and it happens all over the place in these fights. One fight that I grew to enjoy despite its difficulty at level 1 is actually Captain Hook. His moves are easily baitable, but it's hard to get a solid opening on him until he does this flurry attack. He always does this three times in a row and then leaves himself wide open. Successfully parrying the attack will keep you safe and you can punish him for it. That being said, it's totally possible to hit him in between other attacks. The timing is just really tight. I'm fine with that. It rewards pushing for more openings if you have the skill to pull it off, and if you don't, he's probably going to smack you. Then, Riku at the top of Hollow Bastion really doesn't feel significantly different at level 1. Just longer and I can't spam counterattack. The reason I bring it up is because this footage is an excellent way of exemplifying my problem with the physical attacks in this game. Watch this footage. You can see what my strat is. Wait for Riku's jump attack and then hit him, perform a full combo, and heal after the retaliation. 
What I want to point out here is that I often whiff these attacks due to the physical attack Sora chooses to use. Had he chosen the stab attack, I would have hit because of its longer reach, but because of where I was standing when I attacked and where he moved after I attacked, I miss because Sora chose a move that will result in a whiff. This isn't an enormous problem to be sure, but it only really comes up on some bosses and even then, it's only really a problem on level 1 because the game has some abilities and things built in that can make stuff like this a little smoother. Not to mention you're less likely to notice whiffs when each hit doesn't matter nearly as much. Sora choosing an attack depending on your location and retaliation to the target is sometimes a problem but probably not enough of one to really count against the combat. We're nearing the end of this video and there's just a couple more things I want to discuss. Firstly, the game gives you secret movies if you beat it after meeting certain criteria, depending on the difficulty you are on. The first one, Another Side Another Story, depicts a cloaked figure similar to that of Unknown walking in a rainy city at night. When accosted by Neo Shadows, he pulls out two keyblades as another man on top of a building splits the clouds to show a meteor shower. The first man asks, where is Sora? And the second man responds, we'll go together. Finally, an older looking Kyrie stands on a beach as a meteor falls from the sky. The second secret movie, with the same title but subtitled Deep Dive, was added in Final Mix and is a bit more difficult to unlock. It starts off showing Sora in this dark, twisted place with a bottle washing up on the shore. A man in a black cloak steps out of this boulder and we see his eyes glowing yellow. Then we see what appears to be a continuation of the first secret movie, the dual wielder taking on many Neo Shadows at once. Then he begins running up the building toward the other man in the blindfold. Text begins flashing across the screen before finally ending in the number 2, and we catch a glimpse of King Mickey and another one of those black cloaks. Finally, two men are standing on the beach in this dark, twisted place. One says, I went to see him. He looks just like you. Everything is coming back to me. The true. And then it ends. As for what these movies actually mean, well, there's only so much we have to go on. Based on their hair, we can probably assume this man on top of the skyscraper is Riku. We know it takes place a decent amount of time in the future since Kairi and Riku are both much older looking. We have no idea who this other guy is. It's possible he's related to Sora somehow, since the other guy tells him that he looks just like you. But that's all we've got. The connection to Sora is stronger by the fact that he wields the Keyblade, too nonetheless. He's clearly very powerful. Now this twisted land, it's the first we're really seeing of it. Using some context clues, we can probably say that this is the realm of darkness that Ansem talked about in one of the final mix reports. What Sora is doing there, we don't know. This is all clearly going to be revealed in the sequel, Kingdom Hearts 2, whenever that comes out. For now, it's pretty cryptic. The story in this game is simple. It's intended for a younger audience than I or many of my viewers fall into. And yet, I also believe it's incredibly effective at conveying some themes, as well as flipping some tropes on their head in a way that one would not expect from a game like this. It's got an optimism that is indicative of many Disney properties, and then mixes it with a darkness and undertone present in many Final Fantasy games, with likable and even perhaps relatable villains. This game has a pretty easy startup in this regard because it's borrowing Disney villains that we already know and love, but Ansem is a great contender to fall in their ranks, even the ranks of the best video game villains of all time, for how his story is conveyed and how sinister it is. Now, I want to take some time to zoom in on a few themes that this game specifically aims to explore. Firstly, I love what this game does with the cliché of the Chosen One. This is not a story that plays the Chosen One trope straight, even though it seems like it at first or at face value. When Leon and Yuffie tell you that the Keyblade chooses its wielder, there's a high chance that you might cringe at the sheer been there done that feeling it can give you. But their surprise and disdain at the fact that Sora was the one chosen is completely founded, because it was Riku who was chosen, not Sora. Riku's line about Sora being the delivery boy, while not entirely true, brings up a very interesting question. Why does Sora have the Keyblade if Riku was clearly the stronger of heart? The interchange happens earlier in the game when we first get the Keyblade. You may notice that Riku and Sora are both present. In fact, the way that Riku is talking almost makes it seem like, even in this moment, Riku is the stronger in heart here. Some might think that Sora got the blade because Riku accepted the darkness, but I don't believe that's true. The Keyblade gives no concern for these sorts of things, but simply the strength of the person's heart. We can see this is true because Riku gets the Keyblade later in the game, even though he had firmly accepted the powers of darkness by then. No, I think Sora actually was the stronger of heart here. Riku was confident, calm, collected, and ready to accept the darkness in order to get off his prison island. On the other hand, Sora was clearly afraid, didn't want Riku to go through with it. But what does he do anyway? He reaches out for Riku moving past his fear and believing in his friend anyway. 
And that's what the Keyblade saw. That's why Sora got the Keyblade when he did. Not because he was a generic chosen individual, but because he was strong of heart. Through Ansem, Riku, and many others, we can also see this game exploring the concept of unchecked ambition. Riku is clearly extremely ambitious from the opening moment we see him. He's the only one working on the raft. He's competitive, much more than Sora. This is what drives him to make the choices he does. He accepts the darkness because he saw what it could do for him. He gains power through the darkness that he uses to accomplish his goals. Ansem too had a similar characteristic which we can see play out in his reports. Each one highlights his morbid curiosity and how he goes about achieving his growing knowledge, from creating false heartless to feeding innocent people to the heartless just to see what would happen. This trait is what brings Riku and Ansem together, and is what causes Riku to give in to Ansem's plans. We can see this idea played out in numerous other characters as well, from Clayton to Oogie Boogie to Maleficent herself. They aren't destroyed until they give way too much of themselves for the sake of power. You see, darkness as a concept in this game isn't inherently evil. If I were to use D&D terms, I would call it chaotic neutral. There's no indication in this game that using the powers of darkness makes you a bad person. The dangerous thing is that darkness comes along with relinquishing parts of yourself to the heartless, who will slowly begin to prey upon you and, when you've allowed too much of that darkness into your heart, they will turn and consume you. But the powers of darkness can clearly make you incredibly powerful, from being able to teleport between worlds to manipulating your body or the area around you in extreme ways. It's no wonder that so many power-hungry people fall to the darkness throughout this game. I think Sora as a character is worth talking about as well. His name means sky in Japanese, implying a weightlessness to his demeanor. You would think he could bear the weight of the heavens on his shoulders without faltering. Yet, I find that this isn't the case. His name is almost opposite to his character. He is weighed down by the things he goes through. He doesn't know how to handle the trials he faces. Sure, he keeps going, but occasionally he snaps at people, especially Donald. He acts downtrodden when he can't find his friends, and the perceived betrayal of Riku gets to him so much that he loses the Keyblade over it. His name implies weightlessness, but he is weighed down heavily by circumstance. This is why I like Sora. He has layers that are explored as the game goes on. They never forget that he is a kid, 14 years of age during this story. A kid wouldn't be able to handle all of this destruction so easily, and he certainly shows cracks. It's not so much that it becomes overly dramatic, and it's still supposed to feel like a Saturday morning cartoon in many ways, but Sora still has a depth that makes him very interesting to watch as the game progresses. In a more overarching sense, this game is at its best story-wise when it uses its framing device of traveling to different Disney worlds to explore the relationship and character of the primary people involved. Sora, Donald, Goofy, Riku, Kairi, and Ansem. Stuff like the deep jungle where tensions run high to the plight of Riku and how he ties into the narrative are very well done and satisfying when they pay off. The biggest failing of this game in this regard is the game's exploration of Kairi as a character. She's a sweet, innocent child, and that's exactly it. The game doesn't give her enough time to be flushed out like Sora and Riku get. She spends most of the game in a comatose state, and strangely, once she's out of it, she acts like it never even happened. It's really a shame, because I think she's set up in a way that there could be some interest added to her character, if only she could have had some time to be explored outside of, like, one cutscene after she's revived. What we get is sweet, certainly. I like her reaction to seeing Sora's wall drawing in the secret place a lot, but it's still a shame she couldn't have been explored like the others. So, final thoughts. This game could have been a whole lot less, but because of the passion brought to the table by the people working on it, it became so much more than it had any right to be both in gameplay and in story. Groundbreaking in terms of mechanical depth for the time, as well as codifying many of the action RPG mechanics we've come to love nowadays. It's certainly rough in many ways, especially by modern standards in this regard, but for being one of the first to pioneer the 3D action RPG genre, I think its successes are impressive. The presentation is spectacular for 2002. The animation pops and adds character. The worlds are vibrant visually, if not equally dull mechanically, and the enemies are phenomenally well-crafted. The story is surprisingly well done. It managed to explore characters with more depth than many of the story-driven games we get today. Ignoring the secret movies for a moment, there are no significant unanswered questions the way I see it. A pretty great achievement for a game so full of wild events. Ansem is an incredible villain, and this game also used a drip-feed style to tell his backstory, something we see nowadays perhaps too often. It's an amazing package with plenty of content, and it still stands to me as one of the best games Square has ever made. Yeah, I said it. Kingdom Hearts, fill me with the power of darkness.
This game released a critical and financial success. It made its way onto many best PS2 games lists and was among the highest selling games of 2002. Complaints about the gummy ship missions were the biggest refraining issue in many critical reviews, but generally the reception was positive toward combat and boss battles specifically. The camera was the only thing combat-wise that received panning, something I can't really speak on because the camera was improved in the version I'm playing and I find it to be innocuous most of the time. By the end of April 2003, Square had already sold over 3 million copies worldwide, in just one short year. As you can expect, with success like this, preparation and development for the second Kingdom Hearts title began very shortly after Kingdom Hearts Final Mix dropped in Japan. However, things were not 100% smooth. According to Nomura, a few hurdles had to be overcome before real development on KH2 could begin. One was that he apparently wanted to include Mickey Mouse more prominently, and so approval from Disney would be required before that vision could be fulfilled. Another such hurdle was in Nomura's ideas for the story. He wanted it to take place a year after Kingdom Hearts 1, and he wanted Sora to start at Square 1 again, ability-wise. How do you justify this reduction in power, after all Sora has been through? The answer to that question would be released in 2004, a topic for next time.